All right, welcome everyone. We are back for another podcast. This is episode number 153, The Man, The Myth, The Legend. I got to say he's number one all-time money list, Mr. Justin Bonomo, known as Z Justin in the building. Justin, how are you? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, thank you for making the time. I know this is something I've asked you a while ago, and my, my wife, Amelia, who I know uh, you're friendly with as well, was was uh, was helping to, you know, she's like, got to get Justin, got to get Justin. I was like, look, yeah, you know, I don't want to push anyone to uh, to come on, but I know we had talked about it. you said you would come on, and then obviously this is great timing with you just taking over the number one spot in the world. I mean, it's pretty powerful, pretty crazy, and a, and a pretty insane number, 57,175,262. Congrats on that. And before we dive into other stuff, tell me a little bit, what, what, how does that feel? You know, is this a goal of yours? Is this just great? It happened? Or is this something you've been eyeing and kind of, uh, you know, been, been chasing, if you will, for some time? Tell me a little bit about this, uh, this number one spot. I mean, it feels great. Like poker's my day job. So I don't think of people like, you know, Daniel Negreanu with celebrities in my mind. So sometimes I have to remind myself that like, there's a lot of people out there who actually think what we do like is pretty incredible. Because, you know, when I'm at the table, I'm not thinking about the accolades or something. But it, but it's nice if I'm, you know, back at home. It's I try to take pride in it. I try to remind myself, like, what I do is actually really, really cool. And I should be proud of it. Yeah, well, I, I think that's a that's a great way to look at it. It's true, right? You're so used to it. It's just part of your daily practices and sort of your, your life for so many years now. Um, but it is pretty pretty overwhelming. I think I saw in that year you had you know one of the magical years with Fedor, Dan Coleman, yourself. Where you just won every tournament. Like there's a few runs that stand out. And during that time, I think you had like 26 or 27 million or something insane in one year. And it puts you on like with the whole world in terms of earnings with athletes they were comparing. I think you were number 30 or 20. I don't know. You probably remember you have something like that. Like it was pretty, pretty astounding. So yeah, it's uh it's pretty, pretty incredible. What is um with the current system, you know, there's the hen and mob GPI, there's these rankings, you know, like for for all the different categories for the year, for your state, your country. Uh, how do you feel poker is with that? Do you think they do a good job? Do you think it's like if, if you were running it or if you had your say, do you think there's more that could be done or do you think it's pretty cool? Like with, when you have your family, friends, people watching and sweating, like how, how, do you feel it compares with like the PGA, FIFA, you know, NBA, other things like power rankings and NFL? Do you think it does a good job or do you think there could be more in terms of statistics, data, and sort of the, the way the system is set up? Yeah, uh, good question. Uh, I have a lot of thoughts on that. So in, in any other sport, you're not going to see amateurs playing against Le LeBron James. Like that just doesn't happen in basketball on TV, you know? It doesn't make any sense because LeBron James would win every time. But in poker, the amateurs can win and there's a ton of variance and anyone can win if they have their day, you know? Um, and the other thing is like, if you go on a lucky streak, a lot of poker players will start thinking like they're the best player in the world. Like, that they can compete with the best. And that is why poker is so popular. Um, that is why so many people think they're good at poker. That's why so many people enjoy playing. Um, the flip side of that coin is that means that there's no way to accurately, accurately rank people. You can't just look at a sample size of even a thousand tournaments. Like it just won't be enough to decide who's best. And I, I do like, I'm not against the rankings at all. I think GPI and Hendon Mop, they're great. So people can follow along who's doing really well, uh, but nothing will ever be an accurate measure of who's the best player in the world. If you're only going by tournament results. Yeah. It's an interesting point, but in terms of like aesthetically with, with the, the site, you know, with, with how it's presented the formula or, you know, you know let's say, I don't know if you're a college football fan at all, you know, they have these formula rankings, the coaches poll, the players poll. Like, I feel like it's very interactive, engaging. There's weekly rankings. It's kind of like fun, you know, even if you're not, it's not what you live for is to like be number one or not, but like it's, it's aspirational. It's kind of cool. Like I, I always, you know, this is something I think in content it's missing as well for poker, like to have stuff where it's like people can easily find stuff, track stuff and sort of like engage with it. You know, I think the head and mob and GPI and these things do pretty well, but I just think there could be more, you know, where it's like, it's like the fans, the outside perspectives like are, are like watching it and, and sweating it and more up to date on what's happening i just think there's still room um in the industry and i just curious because i'm sure your family and friends and people must you know want to know how you're doing right they look at they look at your stuff they follow you whether it's on poker news or get to watch you on poker go and i'm sure there's still there's like a fair amount of um engagement and in, in, in watching i just wonder you know what you what you would think that could be differently if anything or even like having a player card or you know because it's also confusing right you play online you're on acr or 
party mm-hmm. poker or GG or these places. Like it'd be nice. It was kind of easy to kind of follow and see. And even like, no, you don't want to text your, your parents like, Oh, I'm, I'm playing here. I'm playing there. Like if there's a way they could easily track and know what's going on where you're at. I just feel like there's more there. I was just curious if you, if you had given much thought to it, or if you think it's, it's a broken system, a decent system or, or somewhere in between with that, in that sense. I don't think it's a broken system. I just don't think the goal is to measure who's actually the best. One right. thing to keep in mind about all these systems is none of them track losses. It would be horrible for poker if there was something public with everyone's losses. Right. Like, I don't yeah. How many rebuys and stuff in every tournament or live? Like, you know, it, it just like, yeah, there's a lot of reasons why that wouldn't be a good thing. Yeah. People who are going on a losing streak don't want that information out there. People might be hesitant to play if everyone would know how much they lose. Like a lot of reasons why it would be bad. Right. Um, so with that in mind, like the goal of the ranking systems isn't to say like who is the absolute best player in the world. They're more ranking systems of like who's hot right now. And I think that's pretty cool. I like the way GPI does it where it's kind of tiered the last 18 months and the recent results in the past six months matter a lot more. I, I think that's about as good as you can get in tournament poker. For sure. And, you know, tell me for those that don't know you somehow, if you're watching, maybe you just stumbled in or you're not, you're new to poker. Give us a little background on yourself, where you grew up and how you found the game of poker. Um, sure. I grew up in Fairfax, Virginia, which is a nice little suburb of D.C., a great place to grow up. Uh, good schools, all four seasons, low crime, that sort of thing. Uh, very diverse, too. Grew up a lot, around a lot of different people, which is pretty cool. Um, I started playing Magic the Gathering. I first played when I was like eight or nine um, for a couple of years, just played with like my neighbors. Um, eventually found out there were tournaments when I was like 12 or 13, was pretty competitive at those at 14, 15, even went to Europe a couple times for pro tournaments when I was 16. Um, and then I think when I was 15, uh, some of my friends who I played poker with, sorry, some of my friends who I played magic with started doing really well at poker, uh, namely Brock Parker. Um, I, I don't know how many old school online players that there are here, but um, he was a legend on the name T Soprano back in like the Eric one, two, three days online. Yeah, I, I remember I was watching him play 100, 200 limit hold'em, and just like, I don't know, seeing a $2,000 pot exchange hands in like 27 seconds, to me, that was like amazing. And I remember thinking like, okay, I'm not going to make this kind of crazy money, but you know, I'm good at magic. He's good at magic. Maybe I could do okay at poker too. Um, and yeah, when I was watching him play, like thinking maybe I could do that, I was never thinking that I would be on the level I'm on now. Just thought, you know, making some, you know, a few hundred dollars would be really cool. And, and Brock Parker, I think he won three bracelets in one summer, maybe, or something like that. Or, and he's had a pretty, pretty uh, strong professional career. I don't know if I'm getting that right. But so that that was like the, the originally when someone was someone brought like a magic deck to just like some of your friends at his house had one. When did you like for who showed it to you? Did someone like say, Justin, you should do this? Or you just kind of saw kids were playing and then you hopped in uh, you, with poker. You mean not magic, right? Well, originally with magic, yeah. Uh, so magic was just, um, I was eight years old and my neighbors brought home like a deck and like mm-hmm. we just played super casually. You know, I was eight. I obviously wasn't going to be competing in international tournaments at that age. Right. Um, yeah. Cool. Well, yeah. So right place, right time. You, you catch in, you find poker. And and looking through on your Hen and Mob, I mean, I, I saw the, uh, let's take a look here at um, this. So, I mean, you can see as you guys, you know, a lot of number ones kind of got everything ticked right here. Best money. <laughs> Frank, he's got current money all time. Virginia is probably, you know, no one in, in, in a distant mile, uh, country mile away there, I'm sure. So you got, you got, you just took this over back to back wins. Um, you know, it's kind of crazy if you look at your results here, just like podium chalk everywhere third, second, second, first, second, first, first. Now, these aren't thousand person fields, but still, you, you're in the zone, you're in the flow. What's working for you? What, what do you, uh, what do you attribute this sort of um, mentality down the stretch to finish out? these tournaments and then to find your way to the top three. And I mean, they're, they're not five person tournaments, right? There's, there's, this one was a hundred K with, you know, there's, there's 20 still, to, it's hard to win. You take down first. I know uh, this is like, I think this pushed you over, right? Bryn Kinney, who had the number one lead, this actually pushed you over. And we're talking uh-huh. about world class guys. You got Jason Kuhn, Dan Smith. You know, what is, what's your ability here? What's, what do you think is your, your superpower to finish out these tournaments and, 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 emerge against the, the top of the top. You're not playing against, you know, amateurs here. You're playing against world-class players who have played a lot. Uh, what, what, what do you think is something that you do just differently from take a great player, like a really good player, but how do, how do you, you know, superpower to make you number one if you can? Is there anything you could define a couple things or attributes about yourself that you think are different than others? Okay, so there's a couple of different questions in there which people might think have the same answer but don't. Um, 
my distribution finish is going to be very top heavy, possibly even relative to players who are better than me. Um, I have a fairly aggressive style. I might not care about the bubble as much as some other players. Like, and don't get me wrong, I do care about ICM. I do care about money. I'm not like so rich that I'm only playing for first or anything. Um, but I think people who watch me play know that you know I like to play big pots. I like to bluff. Um, and the advantage of that is when you get near the bubble or near the final table, you get to keep playing hands. You're you're not handcuffed in like second to last place, just like waiting for other players to bluff, uh, to bust. Um, so what you'll see is players yeah, who have that's, that's not a smart style that's not a smart to be there folding and praying you know and, and i've been there maybe too many times so yeah okay so that so you are the guy who has the chips that you got when the bunny's got the gun you're putting the pressure on ripping it all in making people call off finding spots that you know and this is something that damo what you and him have been having some epic battles and heads up also you know arguably one of the best or the best you guys kind of in that conversation you know it seemed to be like the case right you guys get chips and you use them um you know, which is uh, it, it, obviously you're doing stuff along the way to get that. But sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but it is kind of it is it is it is fascinating because it does seem like you seem to be in those spots with the Damo where you guys are just like steamrolling these guys. And and I guess, you know, if you sorry to interrupt, let me get you back on your train of thought on how maybe how you're doing that or what what portion is it? Because it's it's like, is it from hand one? Is it different in points of the tournament? Because it doesn't mean like you have to still get that lead. You have to accumulate that for that spot. So what, 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 what areas are you maybe taking some risks or you know, I'm not asking you for the secret. I just, you know, you can tell me that after the pod, but just like, give me sure, some sure. tips. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it starts hand one. Like I like to over bet. I like to make big raises, um, especially deep stacked. Um, and Adama's actually a good example. He's even compared to me, he is hyper aggressive. So he's even more likely than me to finish, you know, first or last. And, you know, people don't see all the times that, you know, he's busting a lot early and rebuying. Of course, they're seeing, you know, the final tables where he has giant chip leads and is crushing everyone. Mm -hmm. And even with a chip lead, he kind of takes it to an extreme. He loves opening just like, you know, jack three off under the gun to kind of push the table around. So he's like a, as hyper aggressive as you get in these high stakes tournaments. Right. And you know, is, is, uh, is that something that is that stylistically, would you say from, is this, you know, I'm looking back on January 2005, and I think you had one of the earliest EPT, you know, you're the youngest player to make EPT final table. I'm not sure if that was that particular, or there was like a, an official one. I think you were like 19 years old. Maybe it is this one, um, this one right here where you got fourth. But uh, is that something where you, you would say from the beginning of time? I mean, you've obviously adapted and adjusted, but were you always sort of aggressive and it was just like part of your game? Or has this really come into light in the past few years, this style? Um. Yeah, it's funny that you're going back to a tournament when I was 19. Um, around that time, maybe when I was more confident in my game, like 21, 22, I used to brag about the fact that I didn't have a style. And what that meant to me was I could sit at a table where everyone's loose and like I understood like, okay, this is a table where I need to just wait for the nuts because they're going to pay me off every time. Or I could mm -hmm. get moved to a table where everyone was super tight and just like raise every hand and take advantage of them. And I've really prided myself in that for sure. Um, and I still... As poker has developed over the years, as players have gotten better, what you've seen is kind of like the optimal style has like merged into like one strategy that people agree on. Like you no longer have pros who are playing 50% of hands in high stakes tournaments. Like you just can't win doing that anymore. Mm -hmm. And especially now with the solvers, there is an idea of like, this is how much you should be check raising. If you do it a lot less or a lot more often, people will take advantage of you. Um, that being said, um, there are some mistakes that I think other players are making. And one of them, I think, is going by straight ICM calculations. Um, ICM doesn't really factor in this person has a chip lead and they'll be able to run over the table for the next 100 hands. Um, and so I do adjust to kind of factor that in, and I think it does help give me an edge. Very interesting. And in terms of solvers and, and whatnot, this is obviously prevalent in this day and age, and, and either, you know, it's changing because, like, at some point, people who are doing the work originally when it first came out and doing the, all the, the, the deep dive stuff. Now there's a lot more ready stuff, right? Softwares where you can kind of plug it in or someone does the work and then you get to get to view it. You know, how, how in terms of solver land world, how advanced were you? I mean, were you like level one, like in terms of no one else do you think was doing it or with solvers, is that something that you've gotten more into in the past few years? Uh, and, and, and how much would you say like work on study wise are you doing compared to playing in general? Um, honestly, not enough these days. Um... During the pandemic, I didn't play too much poker. Um, I'll, I'll start at the beginning, though. Um, 
I've just always been insatiably curious. Like I've always like really wanted to know what the right answer was. And for the longest time, like I, I remember we'd have debates like, can you play Jack 10 off suit from the hijack? Like, is that a profitable open? And then however long ago it was, six years ago, PO Solver comes out and all of a sudden it's like, we can look up a lot of the things that we had questions about. And that was just an incredibly fascinating time in poker to me. Um, I had so many questions and I spent hours just you know, running the simulations because you didn't have all those like pre-made packages back then. You kind of had to do it all yourself. Mm -hmm. um, I, I bought a secondary computer that I could just like team viewer to so that I could, um, it had, was it, I can't remember, I think it's 256 gigabytes of RAM. And so I would just have it running like Sims uh, just like overnight. And you know, the Sims would take like four hours to run or whatever. Um, but eventually I built up like a huge database of them um, so yeah, when PO Solver first came out, I was studying a ton. Um, I have I have to admit my um, drive to study has kind of waned a little bit. Now it's more like I'll play a tournament. I'll be like, okay, I'm a little bit rusty in this spot. I'll look this up after the tournament. But I'm no longer putting in the like eight hour study sessions that I was at first. For sure. And is that is it hard to stay motivated when you're you know you're you're having all the success and 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 doing well is this like now i mean you and brent are neck and neck for number one all time is that important to you was that something i mean now you reached it right like it's it, you guys are literally within a few hundred thousand so that could flip flop a lot there's other guys nearby is it important to you to be number one or are you like i want to get a lead and then i'm going to stop do you have any plan i like asking you 12 questions at once if you have no but let's just start with that is number one it, how, how important is that to you to have reached and and from here does it matter much because it will it will be moving around i'm sure at some some points right just natural and how it's going to go but is that something that's important to you to be that to hold that spot or is it just like i reached it and now kind of whatever happens you're good with uh yeah so what's been really important to me call it the last 10 years is work-life balance um, I, I think if your whole life is poker, that you're not going to be a very well-rounded human being. I know personally, I'm not happy when I'm just poker, poker, poker. Um, so it's been really important for me to say being number one is or would be cool, but I'm absolutely not going to kill myself to it for it. Um, if I don't want to go to Prague in December because I want to be with my family or doing like whatever else, I'm going to focus on what I want to be doing in life, not just traveling nine months out of the year. And, and I did that a couple of years, nine, nine months nine months a year on the road, like that gets to you. That's not a great way to live your life. It's hard to have friends. It's hard to go to a doctor's appointment when you need to. Um, just a lot of things are a huge hassle when you're doing that. It's, it's really hard to stay healthy. Um, so that being said, I'm not willing to kill myself to be number one. Um, and, and let's jump back to um, two or three months ago. Um, I went the whole pandemic without playing live poker. Uh, I just didn't feel it was safe. Uh, travel restrictions made it hard. Um, and then once people started to be vaccinated, I saw the World Series had a uh, vaccination requirement. Um, and that was kind of what set me over. OK, now I, I'm ready to play live poker again. And I was a little bit nervous. It had been almost two years since I played live poker. Uh, I didn't know, was I going to hate it? Was I going to enjoy it? I had no idea. Um, and I told myself, you know, I'm going to fly out there one way ticket and I'll keep playing as long as I enjoy it. And I'll leave as soon as I don't anymore. Um, and fortunately, right off the bat, my second tournament, I finished, you know, second super high roller bowl, then have all these other first and second place finishes. Uh, so I, I've really just loved being back. And, and it's really nice. Um, I'm not having to force myself to play. I'm actively enjoying playing. And that makes the hunt for number one, like really, really fun. Um, I don't feel like I'm making huge sacrifices. I just enjoy every second of it these days. Uh, so as long as that's true, I'm going to keep playing. For sure. No, I, I think, you know, mindset, it is so important when you don't, you're not distracted and you're not unfocused when you feel good, you're happy to be playing. Of course, it makes a big difference, especially at the highest level. Uh, and these results really are, um, it's insane. And and we, we actually played together, not much this WSOP, but I think it was, it was the last ever event at the World Series of Poker for tournaments. It was like, what was it, the 5K? Um, maybe it was a turbo or something. I think you got it in good in Boston, and then I busted just short of the money. Um, that we played a bit together, but uh, how does that, the Rio, what does that mean to you? Not necessarily the venue, but just like the result, like the, I mean, I guess you've been playing there since the start of the WSOP, since you were eligible to. So really the only place, you know, you weren't in the Binions or Horseshoe era. I don't believe before, same as me we around the same time. You know, what is the Rio meant to you? And, and are you excited about a change? Are you like, wow, this is cool to be a new venue and you know, it's new. Or are you like, man, like I know the Rio so well, I've had so many great memories there. You know, are you sad? Are you happy? Are you undecided? What, what does it mean to you with the WSOP moving on venues? 
I mean, all of the above. Um, I'll be honest and say that I don't think the World Series has ever been the best run tournament. Uh, I think they care too much about profits and not much, not too much about customers or their long term goals. Mm -hmm. um, they tend to not listen to the players very much. Um, that being said, they run a huge tournament series that draws in players from all over the world, so it's kind of hard to miss it. Um, the Rio, um, you know, unfortunately, it's not the nicest hotel in Vegas, um, but the location is super convenient. Um, you know, I moved to Panorama Towers the first chance I got when I was what, 22, I think. Uh, just an amazing location a mile away from the Rio. You can drive into that back parking lot super easy. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my biggest worries is like, what is the parking situation going to be? Like, what happens if there's an accident on the strip? Like, are you just going to have a tournament where 50 people are late and blinding out on day two? Mm -hmm. um, and I haven't seen the parking situation. I haven't seen the venue space. So I don't really know. Um, it, it's hard to have a casino that's like not, <laughs> that's less nice than the Rio. So it'll probably be nicer. Um, right. We'll have to see. Um, there's a lot of like conveniences I'm worried about. Like, will All American Day be there? Will there be good food options? Will you have to go from like Paris to Bally's if you get move tables or reg another tournament? And, yeah. you know, honestly, I don't know. It, it'll be something different. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with different. Hopefully yeah. they execute well. Yeah. Big shout to AAD because he has become a staple. It's kind of hard to imagine <laughs> what was before him and, and what was going on in the food quality um, there. So, yeah, hopefully that'll happen. I think it is going to be in like the convention and there's like 400 plus tables in the room and should be really nice and a cool change of pace. But, yeah, the parking issues, it is what, you know, it is what it is. I'm sure it'll work out or maybe it'll be some shuttles or some other some other systems or stuff in place. But, yeah, it'll be interesting to uh, to change. Um, what is uh, – give me some – outside life stuff right now like tell me you know first of all for the predominantly male show uh for the ladies listening or watching are you single relationship wise where, where are you at and also what hobbies what are some hobbies so i'll hit you with the double we'll, just, we'll still stick to two questions at a time and i'll try not to <laughs> um i i'm not single these days um i'm actually polyamorous um for those who don't know it is the idea that um just like you can love two children or two parents you can also love two romantic partners um, so I'm in multiple relationships. I would say at this point, um, there's only one that's been, I've been in for over a year that I would call a serious relationship. Um, uh, but I'm, we're also both dating other people. So um, just to clarify, so that it is two specifically, you're in one and one, or it could be more, it could just be numerous, oh, many, or you're saying two, but it could be more than two. I mean, polyamory directly translates to multiple loves, many loves. Right. Um, okay. so it's, it's not, not limited to, it could be any number. Right. Two seems... Two seems, uh, you know, doing one well is is intense. So two seems like aggressive, and more than that, maybe just, you know, yeah. At some point, maybe it's it gets crazy. Well, can I ask what's the most of this word that's hard to pronounce? But is that what is polynamorous? What what's the most you've ever entertained at one time? If I can ask. Um, like, so the way it's man, uh, yeah, sure. The way it's manifested itself for me is, you know, I, I travel a lot. I'm super busy a lot. Um, so rather, you know, there are some people who have their polycules of, you know, eight different partners in the same city. Um, but for me, it makes sense to kind of have more like casual partners that I see, you know, a couple times a year in different cities around the world. Um, it's really nice when you're traveling, playing poker tournaments. Um, I, I would say I've never been in more than like two super serious relationships at the same time. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'll still have other partners who I love and care about, you know, even if I only get to see them once or twice a year. I wish we had saved this for later because now I, I forget the poker in number one and 57 million earnings and whatever. I, this is fascinating to me. And, you know, uh, I, I, I must say I'm not so familiar with this concept or term. Obviously, I understand it make you know, I get it. And I've heard different variations of relationships. And, and nowadays things are more progressive thinking and, and more whatever. It's less, you know, get married at 18, one person for life, all that. But um. Anyway, very fascinating. I, I think uh, those, I don't know. If, I actually did not know that about you. I did see in my notes. My dad sent me a big notes. I didn't know that. That, that was a, but uh, listen, I'm not going to question. You seem to figure what you do, you do well. So I'm sure it's working. I'm sure it makes sense. You know, I'll tell Amelia to put her earmuffs on. I'm not going down that, <laughs> that, uh, that, you know, I, but, 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 uh, you know, listen, very cool. Very interesting. Um, what about kids? Do you want to have kids? Is that something, again, same concept? You could technically have you know, multiple relationships, multiple kids, or have you thought about that yet, kids? Um, for me, like, there are just so many things that I want to do, and I could never find enough time to do them. So adding kids to the list seems just, like, impossible for me right now. 
Um, it's a good answer. It's true. It is. Yeah. It is true. I have one and one I have more and it's, uh, it does definitely, you know, if you look at a pie chart of what you're doing, what you want to do, um, you know, a kid is very important and, and a big responsibility. So yeah, of course that, that's a, that's a good way to yeah, wait, you know, you're not a man's less in a rush than a woman as well. How old are you? 36, seven. Yeah. 36. 36. And you know, it's not that I'm completely closed off to kids. Um, th there are some, like one of the great things about polyamory is you might see, Households that have, you know, six parents living together, raising two kids, like that is something I would absolutely be open to. Very, very interesting. And and where do you think you'd want to settle down? Actually, I have, I have a residence at Panorama as well. Spent some of the time there. Uh, great, great place. Great location. Love the building. Um, where would you think where is home like to set up? Is Vegas? Is that in your heart? Like you'll probably always make that a hub or is there any other cities that you would entertain calling home and, and setting up shop? Yeah, Vegas will always be like a secondary hub as long as I'm playing poker, um, but it's absolutely not where I would want to raise a family. Um, I spend a lot of time in Vancouver and really love it. Uh, when I moved away from California when I was uh, like 22, um, I kind of always said that I'd end up back there one day. Um, yeah, it, if I'm in the States, I would say it's going to have to be somewhere in California, uh, maybe San Francisco area, maybe San Diego area. I'm not really sure. Very cool. And and what is uh, give me a, give me something that st stands out in your career. So we got to go a long way down. You know, your first ever that that you already I guess probably playing online. I and mean, you're known as one of the most prolific online players ever. Z Justin, uh, who knows how much you've won total, right? Because it's like pocket fives and now party poker with names and new names and aliases. It's kind of hard to like track. You definitely I'm sure you've won many millions online. What, what at this point of your career, where were you when you started playing here? Like, had you already got, like had a nice bankroll or was this like you want a satellite and you were just dipping your toes in poker in general and now you're playing live or did you already like, were you already pretty prolific online at this point? Um, yeah, I, I had a bit of a name online. Uh, so I was 19 at that tournament you highlighted. Uh, I started playing online poker when I was 15. I started actually making money at it when I was 16. Uh, I remember I was, I was super excited that... Um, the summer after my junior year of high school, I made $4,000 over the summer playing like one, two, two, four limit hold them. Um, and you know, I, I thought that that was like such a huge amount of money. I was like so happy with it. Mm -hmm. Um, but then it, it like really skyrocketed my senior year of high school. Um, eventually I started playing, um, like $200 sit and goes and started like really crushing those. And I had a six figure bankroll by the time I finished high school. Very nice. Very nice. That's funny. You say that. similar. I played limit. Hold them uh, a similar kind of time and stakes and all that. And uh, I remember Bahamas, those were like the first trips really went down there. PCA, maybe you were a little, a year or two before me. Um, Cause I think you're one year older, but um, I started around the same time. Tell me about like a first meaningful score, like a bankroll booster. Cause I see here, I mean, this is a pretty special one, right? You get some scores, 15, 40, 50, you get a 152 six figure score. Were you at this time now? I mean, similar, similar, right? It's not, it's, it's in later in the year though. Had you already had a much more success? I mean, this is a big spot. You're playing for, at this age, you're playing for 2.2 million, seven left. I mean, look at Haralabob. You got Legends. You got Anto you got Daniel Legrand, you Hashem, who had just won the main event. And I forgot he took this one down as well. Um, what was that like? And, and how big of a moment was that for you uh, at that time? That that was brutal. Um, the World Poker Tour is six-handed final table, TV final table. Um, you know, so that's kind of the goal. I was doing really well with eight players left and then just like got sucked down on like three times in a row. Um, so that one was actually an incredibly frustrating one. Um, let's go back though. Um, let's talk about the second tournament on that list. Okay. Um, EPT Deauville. Um, yeah. So I was 19 at that tournament. Um, the youngest ever. They said, I saw a note about like youngest ever at a EPT. So is this the main event or was it a side event? Is it a main one? Yeah, EPT main event. Uh, they okay. were often only okay. uh, 2K buy-in back then. And okay. I had just dropped out of college. Um, yeah, I basically got to the point where I was making so much money playing poker that I felt it would be irresponsible for me personally to stay in college. I'm certainly not saying that that is advice that everyone should follow. But for me, like the painting was on the walls. The writing was on the walls. Um, and, and yeah, at this tournament... At this point in time, no teenager had ever made a televised final table before. So at this tournament, I became the first ever teenager to make a TV final table. And that's pretty cool to be the first to do something because, you know, no one can ever take that away from me. No one else will ever be the first teenager ever to make a final table. That's like a record that will always belong to me. Uh, so I'm really proud of that. 
that's that's yeah. cool. Yeah, that's uh that's a that's a walk down memory lane. Yeah, it's one thing I will say I love about the GPI and the Henna Mob, like being able to click back and have that record sort of journal to see what happened, how many players, where you were. Cause I mean, look at how many, how many scores, how many different stops, different years, the World Series stuff starts kind of blending together. So it's kind of cool to look back and 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 see all you know the results and who was there, who we were playing, who we were facing. We, give me like the first as I'm scrolling here, stop me if you see when was one that was like a life changing. Uh, or, or memorable for you because I mean these are still 160, 130, you know, 230 second. That's got to be that's got to be tough, right? World Series bracelet to win one. I mean that was uh, you look Eric Lindgren, um, you know, Robel legend. A lot of a lot of big names there. Howard Letterer, uh, yeah. Haxton, some you know these guys. Dave Williams, Roland DeWolf. I mean big names there. What what was that like to lose that heads up? And at that point you were kind of cruising. I'm sure like from online and everything you were you had a significant role. Yeah, um, that was another very memorable tournament. Um, I remember the talk of the tournament was, well, it had been for some time that like Eric Lindgren may be the best player in the world without a bracelet. And I kind of like thought, you know, honestly, I thought it was better than him. And I also didn't have a bracelet. And, you know, a lot of the old school pros, they like they like the people that they've seen at these WPT final tables and, you know, the TV pros. Um, and, you know, it would have been nice to show the world that like, you know, of course, you don't show the world that you're better than someone by beating them heads up. But yeah, I really wanted to win that one. Uh, I ended up having three second place finishes in the World Series before I finally won my first bracelet. So for quite a long time, that was a very frustrating thing for me. For sure. That's very interesting. And, and looking back now, like tell me, Justin Bonomo in 06, 08, what were you doing? How are you so good so early comparatively? Because now there wasn't PL Solver. You have a great group of friends, I'm sure, that you're, you're discussing and theories and hands and you guys are sharing like that's like common within poker you have kind of a circle and you know I, I mean maybe you could talk to me a little bit about your crew then who you were really close with in poker at the very beginning um and also what do you think separated you how were you able to inherently just be better than that's like significantly better than many people at that that age when there wasn't a ton of information out yeah um so i think instilled by my family was the idea to just kind of like think for yourself my dad was like and still is a very outside the box thinker. And I, I learned a lot from him. Um, also my, my older brother. Um, and then the other thing was just, I had so much training on games. Like all I did from age eight was play games, whether it was Nintendo or magic or Starcraft or poker. Like I was just gaming all the time. Um, and so to a lot of people, they'll play a game for the first time. And it's, it's weird, abstract information. Like if you get two points for this and five points for this, like, what does that mean? How do you balance strategies? But for me, it just makes sense. You tell me a new rule and automatically I'm thinking like, okay, with this in place, I need to start thinking about my strategy over here. And, and the wheels are just turning constantly. Like I just speak the language. And the advantage that gives me in the poker table is I'm able to just like, not just copy other strategies, but actually understand like how these strategies interact with each other. You can kind of give me two strategies and I'll be like, okay, strategy A will completely kill strategy B if they're you know head to head against each other. And I'm just kind of able to stay one step ahead of my opponents because of that. Very cool. And who? Give me a couple names like then and now that you're sort of like you you pick pick each other's brains or you think you, you respect and then you sort of your poker circle and has it changed? Um, and maybe some players aren't still around playing that you played with them. But like, give me 06, 07, 08, early on. Who was your crew? You travel, go to dinners with, and then really share a lot of poker with. Uh, sure. Uh, the first crusher that I started talking strategy with was Ozzy eighty seven. Um, I, I don't know how many people here are old school enough to remember him. O Z Z Y, right? Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah, he he was another guy who could just see like what other people were doing and be able to see like, okay, we just start three betting in these spots. Like this is how we take advantage of them. Um, and yeah, I, I learned a lot from talking poker with him. Um, part of that crew was also um, Roman uh, Yatsiki. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, Empire 2000, he, he now plays like high stakes mixed games in Bobby's room and stuff. Uh, Mr. Smokey won Steve Bilarakis. Uh, he was the youngest player ever to win a bracelet um, and maybe the youngest player ever to win two bracelets. Um, mm -hmm. He had twins though and lives in Chicago now, doesn't play too much poker. Uh, nice. Brand, Brandon Schaefer and Carl Olson were, were kind of part of the crew a little bit. Nice, nice. So yeah, big, yeah, but a lot of firepower there, a lot of, a lot of early adopters and thinkers. Um, and you know, looking back now, 
do you feel it's more fun or or was that like the, the wild west when you're like traveling making a name for yourself the the bankroll going to countries and places for the first time like traveling the world your family and friends probably think you're a superhero like who is it what the hell he's playing winning hundreds of thousands in monaco and and deville and these places or is it more fun now because it's like you did it you, you are number one and you know it's just kind of like the world's your oyster what, what what is uh if you had to compare and contrast give me give me what you think is um you know what do you prefer or, or how are they different I, I would say it was more fun back then uh but like just being a, like a trailblazer trying to like disprove everyone like everyone thought all these young kids they're never gonna last like it's it's the tv pros the field players who are like clearly the best players of the world the justin bonmos have nothing on them like mattis house and so it was fun kind of like proving the world wrong um, it was also just fun because it was new and it was exciting and, you know, we were making names for ourselves, like building our bankrolls. Uh, the game was also very different back then. Uh, it's kind of, it's honestly a little bit more fun to just be like, I'm thinking one step ahead of you, therefore I'm winning rather than I spent 30 hours studying last week alone. So I'm going to have an edge. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that aspect of it was cooler back then. And, and what do you, what do you think of the current state of poker? Obviously you have to, the, doesn't I mean you're happy because you're emerging as number one but like where do you think it's going do you think that the, you see the numbers up it's crazy live you know let's take live and online like what's the current state of poker and what's your kind of prediction moving forward for um how poker is going to go in what, what direction do you think we're healthy is, it, is the game in a good place right now um no um obviously the pandemic means that you can't call live poker like a healthy place right now um, yeah. I think it's unfortunate how loosely people are they're taking the restrictions. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I came to Vegas, I thought, okay, everyone's going to be vaccinated at the World Series, and now I'm finding out that's not true. I thought there would be measures in place for people who have COVID to reduce the spread, and you know, some people are being responsible about that. Other people are throwing giant parties and lying to people about the fact that they had COVID so that they can still hold their parties. And like, mm -hmm. that's really unfortunate. Um, yeah. There are other places without vaccine ma mandates that require you to wear masks, and people just aren't wearing masks. Um, and, you know, I'm seeing people in the bathroom not washing their hands and like, okay, come on people. Like, yeah, we're not asking that much of you. If you, if you don't do anything else, at least wash your hands when you go to the bathroom, it literally could save someone's life. Like that's not asking too much. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I, I'm with you. I agree. Like there's a, it, obviously a real situation stuff's gone on and it's um, you know, I think that ultimately I would say the world series, it was, there wasn't, you know, I, I was, I was just like kind of initially it, it I was thinking there's gonna be an issue or something's gonna happen. It, they seem to do a pretty good job, like where I mean, not even doing a good job. Just like I was, it, things were well contained. I didn't. Did you notice? Like at the end, I saw a couple of people say they withdrew, and there was a few issues. But I don't. All in all, I don't think I really heard any kind of like widespread that where people got. You know, it was like an outbreak. I mean, did, how, how do you feel? Like it, in your anticipation when it started to where it went, how do you think it was? Like one to a hundred, how do you think the whole situation was handled and went for COVID there? Um, somewhere in the middle, because like, it could have been a lot worse. Um, it, at the start, it appeared to be great to me. Um, it was only at the very end of the world series that I started hearing about these loopholes, ways people were able to get in without being vaccinated. Uh, I'm not going to share those ways because I don't want to encourage anyone else to do it. Right. Um, and you know, real quick aside, please get your vaccine. It is safe and effective and like, can save the life. Maybe not your life. Maybe, you know, someone else's grandparent, like do it to be a good citizen, please. Sorry, you probably don't want to get too political. No, no, I, I let, listen, no, I, I'm, um, let's teach his own. I'm, uh, yeah, it's all good. I'm happy for people to share their stuff. Like I said, I got vaxxed. I, same kind of thinking. I'm just like, look, I'm not a, I'm not an expert. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a doctor. Um, you know, I have grandma's 96 years old, my parents and, you know, ultimately, um, you know, but I, I just, yeah, I'm with you. I'm, I'm with you about, I think it's just like, do the right thing. It's probably not about you or I who's healthy and younger comparatively, but yeah, you don't, you don't want to be a cause or, you know, I'm, ultimately I'm sure no one wants to be responsible for anyone being sick or, or worse. So yeah, I'm with you. And, uh, you know, I think uh, I did hear rumors of that too. I heard some like stuff about, Oh, people are getting fake this or that. And I don't know. I didn't want to know. Um, you know, hopefully it wasn't very many people doing that, but I do know there were some people trying to circumvent the rules and, and situation, which is unfortunate because there is inherent risk and danger when you, uh, start making those decisions, right. When you start trying to play, do these things that you're not an expert in and, and you're, you're risking other people. I, I'm with you completely on that. 
Um, with that being said, what are your plans moving forward? Do you have any, you said you kind of alluded to, you may be staying at home instead of Prague, coming up family stuff. Or do you have anything on your plan on the horizon for trips or, or poker? Or are you just kind of taking it in and relaxing coming up? Yeah, I mean, I'm still in Vegas. I'm going to play the five diamonds, some of these 25K high rollers. And then there's a really cool end of year event um, with Poker Go. Uh, I forget the name, but Poker Go Championship Tournament, something like that. Um, 50K buy in, and then not only no rate, but they're actually paying the players a $1,000 appearance fee to show up. Uh, open field, anyone can enter if anyone listening wants to play it. Um, so wow. that'll be a fun one for sure. Uh, and then immediately after that, I'm flying to Virginia to spend Christmas with my family. Um, and then I have really cool New Year's plans, actually. Um, I got into a hobby um, called acro yoga about uh, two and a half years ago. Okay. Uh, for those of you that haven't heard of it, highly recommend Googling acro yoga. You'll see some like great photos of it. Um, basically, you have a base and a flyer um, as a bigger guy generally on the base. And the base will hold the flyer up into very different positions. So the first thing you do is called bird, where you just kind of have your legs up, your arms up, and you're holding them on top of you, and they're you know flying on top of you. As you get more advanced, you're doing like more crazy acrobatic stuff, kind of like throwing them in the air, tossing them around. Uh, the trick that I've been really trying to work at, on right now is called hand to hand, where um, so doing low hand to hand, which means I'm on my back on the ground, my arms are straight out like this, and they are doing a handstand on my hands. Okay. Um, and yeah, I bring this up because I'm doing an acro yoga retreat in Playa del Carmen over New Year's that I'm really looking forward to. Very nice. Um, and it's great. It's so much fun. You get to work with other people. You're playing, you're laughing, there's touching, the, uh, you got to work together. Um, yeah, honestly, my trust, trust, right? You got to, yeah, the person you're doing stuff with, you got, they got to know what they're doing, pay attention, do their best, all that. Is it, is it man and woman, woman and woman, man and man? Is there any combination or is it usually like a generic, uh, what's like the standard default? Uh, any any gender. Um, the the standard, I suppose, would be male base, female flyer, just because mm -hmm. men happen to be bigger than women. Right, that makes. But sense. there are plenty mm -hmm. of male flyers and women bases as well. Interesting. Uh, and my favorite thing about acro yoga, to be honest, is it is the exact opposite of poker in like basically every way imaginable. So mm -hmm. I, I find that it really helps me have that kind of work life balance. Very interesting. Why? And can you give me give me a quick couple couple reasons why those are so so opposite? Yeah, so like uh, I'm an introvert at the poker table. I'm very quiet, um, don't really do much talking. Acro yoga forces you to communicate and work with other people. Um, so instead of being an introverted activity, it's a very extroverted activity. Okay. Um, you're moving around a lot, so it's great for the, for the body. Instead of competing against other people, you're actually working with them. Um, instead of being inside, you're outside, you get lots of sun. Uh, yeah, just so many reasons. Very cool. And how did you stumble upon this? This is not your typical, you know, pick up soccer league or uh, your, your standard hobby. Where did you come about this? From the first time I saw it, and I, I don't remember if it was Instagram photos or whatever, or like seeing it at the park in Vancouver, I just thought like, wow, that's really cool. Um, I actually had a back injury at the time. I herniated my disc um, wakeboarding, just hit the water too hard, I guess. Uh, yeah. So for years it was like, oh, I wish I could do that, but I couldn't. And I was just, you know, working on my back, doing everything I could, uh, seeing chiropractors, um, physiotherapists, doing yoga, working out, working on core strength, just like everything I could to get my back better. Um, mm -hmm. And then when it finally got to the point where I felt like it was safe to try it, I gave it a shot. And, and you know, fortunately, acro yoga has been great for my back and I just loved it. That's that's awesome. And is it, uh, how, what's the learning curve on that? Like, I'm sure you come in, you get a partner, you come in there and meet someone and, and you go up and try it. Like, is that, I mean, is, there, is it like you're doing work outside certain muscle groups or like lift weights on days off? I mean, I imagine there's some amount of core strength and just in general, you can't just, you know, if you're doing no activity and hop in, it must be hard. Is there a barrier to entry? It's actually pretty easy. I would say if you can, you know, walk up a flight of stairs, you can almost certainly do acro yoga. Um, Keep in mind, there's all kinds of different levels. You're not going to be throwing people 20 feet in the air day one, you know, catching them. Like, of course not. Like, I'm not even doing that stuff yet. I've been doing it for two years. Mm -hmm. um, in Vancouver, uh, there's a great um, set of beginner classes run by an organization called Acro West. Um, and I, I got into it at the right time because they were having four different classes a week. Um, there were some other people throwing up classes as well. Um, and, and it's super easy. Um, 
my girlfriend was actually an instructor in the first beginner class I went to. And they, they were just so great about cultivating an open environment because acro yoga can be intimidating. Like if you show up by yourself, you've never done it before. Um, but they're great. They do warm ups. They get you to like play fun games with other people and almost like trick you into doing acro. Like surprise, this warm up game we did is actually like what you need to do to do our first acro yoga move. And wow. you know, next thing you know, you like you're doing acro yoga with other people and just having fun laughing the whole time. That's very cool. What about what else? Uh, growing up, sports? Did you play any sports or athletic stuff, or, or was it pretty much just uh, you know this is like a, a yeah? Obviously, you weren't doing this then. You said you came across this recently, but what about any team sports when you were a kid or tennis or soccer or anything? Yeah, yeah. Um, basketball was always my sport. Um, I, I was never like a star athlete or anything, but uh, I was you know taller than the other kids in my uh, middle school class, so I, I was okay at basketball. Um, unfortunately, my, my back problems actually started when I was like eighth grade, ninth grade. Um, and that basically ended my basketball career like very early. Um, so after like age 16, I didn't really do too many sports and didn't really focus on my physical health enough. And and tell me about the, so we're kind of scrolling up a couple seconds and whatnot. You win a 5k, a circuit event. Was there, what was this, what, what score, when did, when was there one that just kind of pushed you over? Like, were you like. There was like, wow, this was like the crazy, even like shocked you for the moment. I mean, this is a, this is a big one. This was, I remember this actual turn. I think Vitaly Lumpkin won it. Yeah. And Ike, you, I think you were pretty close with Ike back then or now. I don't know. I mean, I think you, you guys are friends and he's crushed the game. But was this, uh, I mean, this was also another huge tournament. That Was this a big, big moment for you or in the 400K? Was that your biggest at the time? Uh, yeah, that was a fun one. Um Isaac Haxon and I became great friends. We moved into Panorama Towers together at the exact same time. Um, to kind of circle back to a previous question, my, my strategy in poker used to be like learn from everyone that I possibly could, make friends with you know as many top players as I could. And then mm -hmm. I met Isaac and it's like, okay, I don't need to make any more friends. Like he has the, like, honestly, he might have the greatest poker mind that there has ever been. Um, well, wow. and I praise that's I mean I've heard I've heard very high praise from him in general like how good he really is but that's that's a big statement so that's uh I mean tell me tell me why how what well, just his way he approaches the game it, it just the way he thinks yeah and he was the first person I met who really thought about the game the same way as me kind of this like game theory equilibrium sense of like okay if these people are using this strategy what strategy comes out on top of it um and, and I, I mean that with a lot of humility because even though I like stylistically thought about the game the same way, he just like was years ahead of me, just like absolutely brilliant. And concepts that like, so like Ozzy 87 kind of like didn't really think about, you know, equilibrium the same way. So having someone who I could talk to about those things and who is already, you know, years ahead of me on them, like, wow, my game just like skyrocketed after I met him. Uh, he also taught me how to play heads up. I ended up making a lot of money playing heads up no limit, largely thanks to him. Um, so yeah, me meeting him was absolutely one of the best things that happened in my poker career. Yeah, very cool. I've, I've heard nothing but good things. Never really, I haven't had a chance to really connect too too close with, with him, but I know a lot of mutual friends and know him well and all say great things. So love to have him on eventually. He's a member of party, so hopefully Team Party Poker. Hopefully we can uh, make that happen. And, and tell me about um, Burning Man. So you went for the we, we've had a few times that we've gotten to enjoy being in the same camp and, and having some fun. W was that what year was your first year? Was maybe the 2015 also, or had you been there before, 16 or 15? Um, I've been to the last six burns, not counting the Renegade burn, which I think makes 2014 my first year. Oh, yeah, okay. So, yeah, it's the first year of me, too. Okay, I think that's right. We're in the same camp and interesting. Yeah, I went 5th, 14, 15, 16. That's where I met Amelia, my now wife. We have our son. So, uh, Burning Man's got a special place in my heart. Is that something, is that a must not miss? Because there are conflict conflicting dates sometimes with Barcelona or stuff. Is that something you're just like, I'm coming back. I don't care. It's on my list every year or, you know, play it by ear. Is that just like a must go for you? Oh yeah. Um, people would always ask me the question, would you ever miss a Burning Man? And I kept saying something like absolutely crazy would have to happen for me to miss Burning Man. And unfortunately something absolutely crazy did happen with the pandemic. Uh, but you know, it is what it is. Um, but no, like I, I have no intentions of ever missing another Burning Man. And it is, an absolutely like soul refreshing place for me. Um, I, I would say it's not for everyone, um, but it is an absolutely fantastical place. It's just like a post 
post-apocalyptic utopian dream world. It it doesn't feel like planet Earth, and there's nothing else like it. And you know, I'm telling you about work-life balance. I, I think poker kind of made me this like zombie who was kind of dead inside. So I kind of seek out these like crazy experiences with like right. wonderful open people, and it, it really helps keep me a, a sane, balanced person. I like how you describe Burning Man. I think that's a, a good way to, to put it. I could put some images on if you if you haven't seen or heard of it, you should do yourself a favor and Google Burning Man. Look at images, and it's pretty pretty spectacular. It doesn't do it justice, but it gives you a good idea of what's going on there. And um, what uh, what is let's take beside Burning Man. Give me some other places in the world that you like to do and, and to kind of. Um, uh, unwind, if you will, because I, I did, and that sort of leads to my next question as well, which I would just show like 2011, Black Friday, right? This is April 15th, 2011, am I right or nine? Why am I thinking it's 11? Yeah, I think it was 11. 2011. Yeah, 2011. So April, you know, here you're probably whatever, you're playing online, January, February, March, April. And all of a sudden you are no longer, you know, in the US online. Tell me about this time period and, and moving to Europe and if you've discovered some places you love to be. Uh, and how this this was with this this kind of shit forcing you to be out of the U.S. and and be um, somewhere else, and what this meant for you. Uh, yeah, I mean that was a really rough time. I, I remember the day that it happened. Um, the Panorama crew, we kind of got drunk in the hot tubs, like me, Isaac Haxton, Scott Seaver. I think Steve O'Dwyer was there, maybe Aaron Bean. And it Power, was a powerful names there. That's a lot of. That's a lot of firepower those are sort of like the great mind yeah the great minds alliance there okay so yeah what's going on what's the mode give me give me a, a bird's eye a bird on the wall a fly on the wall what do you want to call it tell me what's happening are people freaking out are people excited what, what, what's the deal yeah we were just kind of laughing about how like our jobs are over there's no more online poker we're going to have to leave the country if we want to continue and, and our money is going to be locked up and we were like joking about it because we thought you know it'll blow over in like a week or two mm -hmm. and then as time progressed it was like it was real um, I was in a long-term relationship at the time and eventually got to the point where it was like I had to move to Europe to continue with my career and she couldn't leave the U.S. because of her career. Wow. Um, so, yeah, lost someone who I love very much because of Black Friday. Um, I ended up moving to Malta, which honestly I didn't love. Um, if, you, if you like want to retire on the beach all day and do nothing, it's great. But if you need to like get things done, uh, need to get like banking things done, then it's probably not the best place. Right. Uh, was there for three months. Uh, ended up moving to Toronto, which I, I like quite a lot. Uh, the, the winter was a little too cold and brutal for me, but Toronto is a great city. Met some like really cool people there, and was happy to play online poker from there. From um, oh, still there, Jeff? Yeah, yeah. You cut for a sec, but I got, I got you. Um, yeah, I can hear you. So, okay. So you move, why Malta? Why originally there? And like, I mean, Mexico, other areas like Canada, what, what made you, was it a friend, a group of friends that were like looking and discussing and thought it would be cool to try something new or, or how did you come up about that location? Um, yeah, it was actually Isaac Haxton's idea. Um, and Steve O'Dwyer also moved there with us and, um, Isaac's wife, Zoe, uh, the four of us moved there together. Um, it, it, they had very favorable uh, residency laws because, you know, you can't just easily move to the Netherlands or wherever, you know, as an American citizen. It's kind of hard to just like permanently set up a shop somewhere. Um, but unfortunately, uh, the laws became very less favor favorable, literally as we were on the flight to Malta. Oh, wow. Um, and, it, you know, if I wanted to stay there, that would have caused huge problems. But, you know, fortunately, I found a haven in Toronto. Very interesting. And then Vancouver was later. When when did you make that jump? Uh, yeah, I first went to Vancouver about seven years ago. Um, honestly, I, I would just like Google like best places to live in the world. And the two that always came up were Vancouver and Melbourne, Australia. And it was a kind of matter of like, I didn't really know anyone in the cities, so, like tried to convince friends to move to them. And then um, Donnie Stern and his wife, Stephanie, uh, moved to uh, Vancouver and uh, yeah, and I ended up moving there at the same time as them. And then our good friend Jeff Rossiter moved there too. And it's, you know, it's just really nice to actually have friends in a city before you move there. I'm looking through your Hendon Mob. I don't see, I only see, I see one like fourth for 600K in in Australia, but it doesn't seem like you had a lot of caches or, or success there. Has that been one you, you just haven't gone to as much or have you not, not particularly run well there? Because I think I see literally one flag or something for, for Australia for you. Yeah, I think I've only been there twice. Uh, okay. There are a couple years where it was hard to do both PCA and Australia. 
Yeah. Um, and it's just like a really busy time of the year to be like traveling that far when there's other tournaments that are closer. Okay. Um, yeah, I can't say I, I'm, I don't think there's probably a stop where you've ever had adversity or too much of it, but with, that doesn't seem like one that's like your staple, I guess Bahamas, right? That's one you just kind of hit every, you hit every year for a long time. And then, you know, is there any other stops that you just don't miss in, in particular? Um, no, not really. I, I guess the World Series is the only one that I've actually never missed. I think I missed one Bahamas, um, and that was it. Uh, I, yeah, I've only been to Aussie Millions twice, uh, even though I love the city. Monte Carlo I do most years, but not every year. For sure. And then I see, I, I, I see here this big 2 million score. So this is significant compared to the 400K, some 200s. You know, you're hitting, the, you're hitting some, some shots. You're doing well. You're probably still, again, playing a lot online, I'm sure. But this was all of a sudden like a significant jump in scores. What was, what was this tournament? What did that mean for you? Um, yeah, um, that was actually the smallest percent of myself I've ever had in a tournament. Uh, my my bankroll is kind of low, uh, in large part due to having like uh, most of my money locked up for Black Friday reasons, mm. uh, and then went on like a losing streak after that. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of funny to think about how this huge win was, you know, smallest piece I ever had myself. But you know, still like 100k super high rollers were new, and like to win one of the early ones like felt really really good. Um, and that was one of those tournaments where I just like steamrolled the final table. Just like nobody had a chance. Had chip lead the whole way. Had the nuts like every hand. The camera crew was actually thanking me because I won the tournament like four thirty in the afternoon. They're like, oh, yeah, we get the whole get day off. Like, thank you so much. Catch the beach, even maybe or something. Yeah, you got you, exactly. Yeah. Some of those go till two, three a.m. or it's just forever. So yeah, no, very nice. Yeah, you're you're a, a crowd favorite there. That's that's awesome. But still, a significant score. You know, mm -hmm. big deal. And as you said, that is sort of like towards the beginning of those high roller the alpha eights and the series and breaking on now it's like there's 100 k's on a tuesday randomly in vegas and you're just you know it's casual but like this was uh this was sort of a new new concept at the time and what was your thoughts though like so when, when you saw those 100 k's start rolling out were you you know was that exciting to you were you shocked were you like all right i gotta come up with a plan and sell stuff and, and do things like or were you just kind of you know see how it goes because th th this was literally i think the very beginning when it just started started putting them on on tour maybe a year before but pretty new yeah it was cool I, I don't think like the public really considered me to be one of the best tournament players in the world even though i personally thought i was at the time um so you had this like situation where all of a sudden like these high stakes players need to start selling action um and you can only do that if other players think you that you are very good at the game um so you know i was very happy that you know there was a contingency of high stakes poker players who like believed in my abilities and you know that meant a lot to me and then to you know take their trust and take their money and then you know actually win with it like I, that, that's really cool you get to, to share money with like your friends and people who believe in you um mm -hmm. yeah it's really cool when you get to win for the team you know for sure give me give me though what the mentality is different like your money versus others and like give me a, a, a spectrum on What's like the low and high pieces you'll have of yourself? I mean, or in general in the industry, what's like a standard? I mean, I'm not asking for specifics on stuff, but I'm just curious, like, you know, is, is some tournaments, obviously there's different marks, 10Ks, 50Ks, 100Ks, now there's 250s, there's millions. Like what's like a range um, and, and depending on like what you generally would, would do or, or take, if you don't mind sharing some of that. I mean, I'm not asking specifics, but you know, could you give me, give us a little look on the inside of how you determine, like you said, this was the smallest ever and you gave some good reasons why. Um, you know, how, how is this just depending on bankroll, liquidity, um, you know, where do you, uh, how do you make those determinations and what, what is the range? Yeah. I mean, it mostly comes down to bankroll. Um, I've always been very conservative with it. Like my, my logic's basically like I'm doing pretty well, like, you know, I've got retirement money. So like why risk that, you know, I don't need to really take any huge risks. Um, you know, if I play like a 10 K I'll generally have hundred percent of myself. Maybe I'll like swap with some people or something. Um, and a hundred K I generally have less than half of myself. Um, in fact, I don't think I've ever had more than half of myself in a hundred K. And then for like the ultra high buy-in tournaments, like the millions, it's significantly less than that. Mm -hmm. Makes, makes perfect sense. I got for uh, someone in the chat live again, guys, nice to be back on Twitch. My first time in months. So appreciate you guys coming in saying what's up. We do have a giveaway as well. Going to give a hundred dollars in Bitcoin at the end of the show. Uh, if you guys retweet, you're eligible, follow the instructions, and we will take some questions. I've got, we got to save time. I'm rusty. We do have a lot of questions. I don't know, Justin, did you get happen to hit? Did you see the questions on there or any of them? You know, I think we have over 100 questions on Twitter, which is a lot. We're setting records. 
out here, as you would expect from the number one all time um, money earner. But uh, we will save some time. So do you have a chance to see any of those on there? Because I do want to save a bit of time for that. Uh, yeah, I browsed through, and it seems like you've asked most of the ones that I've seen. Um, you know, I just figure I trust you, the expert, and you know, figuring which ones you want to ask me. So, yeah, I, I, uh, I see. Yeah, we'll, we'll, I will try to. I, I have my own notes and kind of just kind of go with it. But I will, I will try to get some of those. We can't get all of them, of course, but we will, we will try to try to get to those. Um, I forgot what were we just talking about. We were just talking about the pieces and the the stuff. Yeah. So yeah, tell me about. How, um, you know, let's talk about swapping because this is something that I actually had an interesting situation happen in a cash game with someone that had stuff that I found out. Someone was swapping like 20% in a private home game, which is a very large number and, and undisclosed. Like, how do you deal with that? Because I, I, a lot of these are 20, 30 person fields. A lot of people are friends. I think it's pretty understood that generally like people are swapping. That's like one form of variance to hedge, right? But like, how does that, how do you approach that? Like, how do you do? Is there a certain etiquette within the high stakes community that you like? You need to disclose at a certain degree, or most of the time, you know the people, and like, will you say, "Oh, by the way, we have five percent, ten percent"? Give me a little look into the etiquette and like what is um, customary, especially in these small buy-in fields, because it's 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 different than a cash game. Where a cash game, you're just at a table with people, right? It's just like that's it. But in a tournament, there's three, four tables in these high rollers, five, even more. Now, how, what is what what is your perceived uh, etiquette sort of on this on this thing with swapping and, and when does it become too much or people need to know? Um, yeah, I mean it, it depends. Unfortunately, there's no like hard and fast rule. There's no consensus in the community. Uh, I think it's very important that you have a much bigger piece of yourself than anyone you're ever likely to be at the same table with. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you know, if someone buys fifty percent of someone else's action in like the World Series main event with you know eight thousand people. Yeah, I think that's understandable because like the chances of you being at the same table as them are pretty small. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that would be very wrong in a small field high roller tournament that maybe has 40 players because you probably will play with them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so generally I'll have at least four times as much as myself as anyone else. That way, you know, I really don't care about how they're doing. I'm just trying to win as much as I can. Yeah. And, and I think if you ever get to the point where you're kind of thinking like, oh, I need to do something to help this person's chances in the tournament, that's a sign like, okay, your swap is too big. You need to start taking more of yourself and less than others because that is very unethical when you are trying to help out another player in a tournament. That should never happen in theory. For sure. Um, and, what, and in terms of like a cash game, if you were playing in a cat, like what do you think would be a good standard rule for like if you're in a, pri a home game? And you swap with someone to disclose or not? Like, what? What is that? What would you consider as like a, a good, like a big swap? Like, is it two percent, five percent, ten percent, twenty? Because twenty is forty, right? Ten is twenty. Because they're like, there's a delta there. What? What is like the number in your mind where it's kind of like a little bit, a little bit high and significant? Do you have? Have you, uh, honestly, I don't really play in home games. Um, I, I would say if you could disclose it, it makes it much more okay. I don't think I've ever swapped with someone else in a cash game before. Um, so yeah, really not qualified to comment on that. Yeah, interesting. That's an interesting debate because it is something I think in terms of poker and transparency and you know, big blind ante, uh, what else? Uh, shot clocks, things that are be making the game better and more friendly and, and safe. And I think that's like some of these things that are just kind of like taboo or just like, it's just almost like not really, there's some like uncertainty in gray areas that are important to kind of clean up. But it, the high roller scene is a bit different, right? Because it's like, these, this is not something you have to worry about in majority of tournaments because it's like you're just it's like so many people and it's usually a small swap or five percent or three percent or ten whatever two percent main events and this and that you're not going to interact with that player but um yeah it's it's an interesting uh situation what do, what do you think about oh that's what someone's saying there are you sick of playing heads up with uh with michael adamo that's what someone's asking at this point it does seem almost like you guys find your way there in these high rollers often um what are your thoughts on this like is this obviously it's good to get heads up right i mean it's been a successful tournament and and probably other people you'd rather be heads up with than adamo but how do you kind of how do you feel you guys are you you guys go out for a beer are you friends are you competitors a little of both what's your relationship with adamo uh adamo's great um you know, it was kind of fun how it developed. I, I won the first super high roller bowl against him heads up. It was the online one. And then we played in person live and he beat me in that one. And then we got heads up again in the giant world series event. It was just kind of like, okay, this is cool. We get to play our tiebreaker match. And, you know, unfortunately he came out on top on that, even though I think I made a couple of like really great, great plays. Um, a lot of people love to ask me about a, a big bluff that I caught him making. Um, but yeah, it's been fun. Like getting to play best two out of three essentially is like really cool. That being said, you know, he's a really tough player and I would much rather play someone who is, you know, easy to just run over heads up. 
for sure. And tell me a bit about um, big buy-in, small field versus smaller buy-in, big field. So I see here this 5,300 Hard Rock, great event, Sunwell Hard Rock. Love love this uh, this venue and, and their what they do. I mean, again, some very strong players and things here. You get second, ridiculous score off a of 5K. I'm sure you have 100%, minus probably a couple swaps, whatever. Big score for a 5K buy-in. What's more rewarding to you, to win a 20-person high roller 100K with the best or – play a 5k you know 2500 entrance um and, and take down like a championship type event like this or, or second like a, for a million dollars what, what's more exciting to you um yeah i think i'm not sure that might have been my biggest bankroll boost on uh, that tournament because i did have such a high percent of myself um mm -hmm. so, so that was a huge one like that was that was a great win um there, there's also kind of this misunderstanding that like a lot of the the solver pros or the math guys like do really bad in big field events um, my track record in these like 3000 player events is actually like really, really good. If you consider like, you know, that I'm not playing them that regularly. Mm -hmm. Um, and also I really enjoyed those events. Um, instead of just playing by the book, you're doing a lot more like adjusting to your opponents. So I really like that. Um, yeah, makes, makes, makes perfect sense. What about mixed games? I see the deuce to seven, you take second, you got your world series bracelet i think was this your first one then and this time 14 uh the six handed is that is that correct or have you won one before yeah yeah so that was crazy um like three days before that i got second in a deuce to seven event at the world series and, and i tweeted something like um always a bridesmaid never a bride it was my third second place didn't have a bracelet yet. i think i remember that actually yeah that tweet. and then Literally the next day, I enter this 1500 six max no limit event with 1600 players, and three days later, I win that tournament and get my first ever bracelet. So, and I, I think I'm, I'm really happy with the way that that story unfolded. Oh, it yeah. was crazy! I when I I got Mike Sowers, uh, Mike Sowers got second in the opponent. I had great player too. Yeah. I, I like I won a I coolered him, won a huge all in, and crippled him. It, it was like I had. 96 percent of the chips in play like i had him 20 i actually think it was more than that. i think i had him like 100 to 1 in chips and that he won like four all-ins in a row and i was just thinking oh my god i'm the most cursed person ever like i just can't win a bracelet no matter what i do right yeah it's like mental and, at some point like oh, you just get so hard to close actually win that last hard that river card to hit but then but then it got you handled it so yeah my, my chip lead got down to only like a three to one chip lead and i was like i was on i was so tilted like i just I thought I had lost at that point, but then I was able to close it out. And just the way everything went down made it like a very emotional win for me. So that was a big one. Really felt that one. Nice. And tell me about your, your sun run of all time. Was it 16 or 17? Was it when you just won every tournament and you had the record year of all time? Was it 16? Uh, 2018. It started at like the very end oh. of 2017. And, and to That's when you know that things are going well. Cause I thought I was looking at 16. I was like, Oh, this looks pretty sweet. There's a lot <laughs> of scores, 500, 800, 700, 300. 600 we're still there so all right 17 uh okay. De De november december of 2017 is when it starts so keep scrolling up all right so things really start going phenomenally well here so tell me at this point yeah what what happened what clicked and when did you realize you were on real heat like something super special like was it after i mean was it was it literally like you could just feel right you know, was it in January when it got a little silly or when did, when did you realize like, wow. And what did something click or was this just your running hot? Had anything changed any like little adjustment or something that happened that you think you, you did to, to, to help spark this? Or was this just like, you know, luck when preparation meets opportunity and things just align? Yeah, I get that question a lot. And I'm going to say something that might surprise some people. Um, when Dan Coleman went on his absurd run, he was not the best player in the world. When Fedor Holtz went on his absurd run, he was not the best player in the world. When Bryn Kenny went on his absurd run, he was not the best player in the world. When I went on my absurd run, I was not the best player in the world. Michael Adamo is not the best player in the world. Um, everyone I named, like, absolutely a great player doing a lot of things right. Um, but, yeah, I think in 2017, I was one of the top five or top ten tournament players in the world. Uh, just had a really awful year because of variance. And then 2018 was still one of the top five or top 10 tournament players in the world, but not number one. And I just had the most God luck ever. Like, I, honestly, it felt like a dream. Just like no matter what I did, I just couldn't lose. And yes, I was playing great poker, but I still think, you know, Stephen Chidwick was probably a better tournament player than me at the time. He probably still is. Um, Stephen Chidwick would be my pick for number one player in the world right now. Um yeah. 
And and that's that's interesting. I, I, I Stevie, I hear that answer a lot. And and actually, I, I Steve's like one of those guys I don't know super well, but really respect him, like him. And actually, my um, my my son and his daughter, which are you know, they're both exact one day born apart. They held hands for the first time together. Joseph snuck his first kiss mm. in on her as well. So hopefully, I get Stevie on here and we can talk about that. But what what makes Stevie? How Stevie? How do you separate Stevie from Justin yourself from Adamo? Why? What like just what his his poker IQ? Just like it's every spot, everything, his table presence. What is, how do you give him the, the crown right now? Like yeah, I mean, players. he's got the full package. Um, oddly, you know, he studies a ton. He knows the the game theory inside and out. He, you know, he can find the esoteric, like really small bet sizes, the big bet sizes, the like weird check raises on the river that other people aren't making. Like he knows like every situation essentially better than anyone else in the world. Um, but then he's also got, you know, he's got the great posture at the table. He's always focused. He's never on, on his phone. He, he's paying attention. He's he's also trying harder than pretty much anyone else playing poker that I know of. Like, right. Um, so when you have that combina combination, brilliant guy, he's hungry. He tries hard at the table. He studies hard away from the table. Like, he's just everything. And, and again, I want to go back to this rumor that like, oh, he's a solver nerd. He plays by the book. He doesn't take advantage of players who can be exploited and like, that's just not true. I've seen him make brilliant plays that are clearly not solver approved plays against weaker players. And just like, he's made some great folds, some great calls, some great raises. And yeah, he just has it all. Very nice. Well, if I wasn't already afraid, I'm terrified of Steve. <laughs> so um, yeah, I'd love, love to get him on. And, and I remember playing him. He's one of those names. Like I just said, he won every uh, stars like 10k or 12k package back in the day he owned those steps if you if you probably remember it playing with him and you probably played some of those too but like he was that guy who's like the best sit and go player i think for uh, unanimously for a long time and put a lot of volume in it so it's pretty cool to see you know 15 years later 17 years later whatever it is you know with you guys uh being at the top of the totem pole in that in that regard but um yeah is it uh is is if you were someone at home who's a good player, you're good. You play the World Series schedule, let's say five, 10 Ks, dabble in some 25s, two Ks, three Ks. You like feel like you're a break even weight player. What are some things that you could suggest to someone who's like, you know what, man, I just can't. What the hell? They look at your head and mob. They're like, this is almost, this is make believe life. Like, are you just that much smarter? You know, are you that much harder working? What is it like? What would be some things you think that people could focus on to try to? try to break in. You mentioned some with Stevie, right? Just like that work ethic, that killer focus, studying the whole deal. Like he's got the whole package, but what are some ways that maybe someone's got a kid, maybe they're like not, they can't give a hundred percent of time to poker. What are some tools, resources, ideas, concepts they could kind of focus on, or even just an area of the game, like population tendencies that maybe they're missing or should be thinking about. Give me, give me something for the average, um, average to above average players looking to take that next, next level, make it to the next level. So I, I think out of the group of players that you're talking about, the number one thing that they need to succeed is curiosity, that that drive to know the answer to like, what should I have done in this spot? You know, sometimes I'll talk to those players and like, I'll tell them things that they can study and they'll be like, oh no, th this aspect of my game is really good. I'm just having you know trouble getting lucky. And it's like, right. if that's how you think about it, sorry, you will never ever be a great player. E even the best players in the world are constantly thinking about like, well, I just have no idea how the situation is supposed to play out. Do I bet big? Do I bet small? Is my opponent supposed to continue with this subset of hands? Um, and, and so, yeah, that curiosity really helps. Early on in my career, my approach was like, learn from every player I could, learn from every book that I could, learn from every piece of software out there, learn from every training video, because everything will have something to offer me. I can learn something from every resource. So if you don't have that drive to look at like different resources and study your games in different ways, then I'm sorry, you'll just never be a great player. Well, that, that's a great point too because you know the, the players that are saying that they got really unlucky or they whatever those are the ones you know the guys like you hear it all the time or someone won a tournament and you know it's like if you think you're getting unlucky that's not a good sign and like i hear even you or you're like oh, i'm running good or i'm lucky it's like no obviously that's not it but you know that's a good way to come from like if you think you're unlucky it's probably not the case you're probably missing small blind big blind you're probably not taking advantage of stuff. You're probably not focused. You're probably doing a lot of stuff wrong, right? Like that's like why you're getting unlucky because ultimately the last hand when you lose ace, king, ace, queen for 12 blinds, it doesn't really matter, right? That's not that's not where the game 
is won and lost. I mean, is that fair to say? Is that sort of like a misconception you, you see continuously where players, like it's like an easy cop out, like, oh, I got unlucky or I lost ace king. I had a big hand, the guy had jet, like eights, and now I'm out. But like there's all those other chips and like they're flipping too, but now they're, you know, they can afford to lose. Is, is that is that fair? Is that kind of like a, a generic way you would say you could, someone at home maybe is just like, doing the same thing repeatedly and expecting different results and definition of insanity. Is that kind of fair? That like they're probably just missing all these other areas and then that's just why they're, they're seeing these results. Yeah. With, with just like one small addendum that I want to add, like maybe you actually are getting unlucky. Um, but if you're only focused on that, then that's a problem. So just like you said, these people will, you know, bust ACE King versus ACE Queen to get knocked out of the tournament. They'll be like, Oh, I played perfectly. I just lost this one all in. Like, no, I promise you, you did not play perfectly. You did not even come close to playing perfectly. And if you think that you are playing perfectly, you're never going to be able to improve. So fix that first of all, right there. And and that is also one of the biggest, I think, problems and where gap in poker, which can be improved is, is uh, or, or ways that it's going to get more clear because it is confusing a results or in a game, right? Like I go home, my wife doesn't care. I lost King's Ace, Ace 10 suited for, for 60 blinds all in pre each. You know it's results oriented and so like sometimes you might be playing terrible and have a pretty good run or a result and sometimes you might be playing great and get really unlucky how do you sort of compartmentalize understand break that down you know obviously for yourself it's a lot easier than someone who's an average player or does you know you, you know when you're playing probably your best and when you're not but you know is that tricky though and as for the for the population in general to understand that because of how results oriented poker is Oh, it's incredibly difficult. And humans are very good at finding patterns, pattern recognition. But the mm -hmm. problem is we're too good at it. Um, so everyone is applying all these patterns where they didn't happen in poker. Like, oh, I'm, I'm running so bad with jacks. I'm just going to fold jacks because they never win. Like, no, get that out of your head. Yeah, I have, I have an ace queen. That's my hand. I just hate it. <laughs> I can't win. But yeah, that, that hand should be a friend, not a foe. Yeah. And yeah, so you have to be very analytical and logical and be able to say like, okay, why did bad things happen in this tournament? Like, did I misplay? Did my opponents outplay me? Like, are there ways that I need to improve? And it's really, really hard to separate the signal from the noise. And, and that is one of the differences that, you know, makes, that can be made between a great player and a bad player. And there's also a randomness to it that people don't think about. Some people early on in their career, they make a huge mistake and they get lucky and they win. And now five years later in their career, they still have this like fundamental leak in their game that they've never fixed. I, I will interject for myself personally, and I don't think we haven't played enough or not recently, but you know, one of the things I do find, uh, I would say as a generalization of my game is like, I do find myself not with enough chips late, you know, trying to ladder, being short in spots. And, and that's something I want to work on. But I think also to your point, what you just said, it, it does try to trigger something. It's sort of like that memory, maybe early on, on a bubble or in a spot where like I did, you know, some I'm trying some stuff and it didn't work out, even though it's probably correct. And then I'm like, oh, I had a lot of chips and on the bubble and I did this absurd couple of shoves. It was probably great. Ran in the top of the range, lost. Then I like whatever. I'm like, oh, I should have just done, been patient. I would have finished, you know, that type of mentality. I think that's some stuff that, you, you know, it can be deep and embedded into your DNA of how you play. And that's important to try to, you know, be honest and get feedback and realize that there's things that maybe you're doing that are inherently not good. And maybe for whatever reason, you're just because you have that, that, that position, that predetermined sort of like you're exactly what you're saying. I think that that triggers um, or hits home to me because I think that happens a lot to people, right? They might do something that's mm -hmm. correct. It doesn't work out. And now they just remove that. And now they have a big problem for a certain area of their game for, for a long period of time. So um, yeah. You know, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, there, there's something called winner's tilt that we'd like to talk about, or at least my crew does. And winner's what? Winner's tilt. Okay. Um, and it's just kind of the idea that like you win a couple of tournaments, like now you start playing loose. Now you start thinking you have these amazing reads on people. So you're nice. making bad calls. And what you see is like people who go on hot streaks oftentimes don't have enough discipline after that. Um, and you could take advantage of them. They're just like opening weak hands. They shouldn't be opening. And it's, it's incredibly common. I've seen them happen for 20 years straight, like time and time again, someone goes on a winning streak, boom, they're just playing too loose, too overconfident. And they don't realize like they're not winning because they're making these horrible loose opens. They're winning because they got a little bit luckier than they were six months prior when they were playing pretty tight. It's very interesting. Yeah. I have heard that term actually, but that's, I wasn't, that that's a, uh, that's very interesting. Actually, I, I remember one time, this is when I, I think it was like 2016 or 17. I'm actually trying to find it. Oh, I think I found it. Uh, 
here. It's funny because you actually, I believe the exact same tournament, either the same year you you took second and then first. Do you remember this one, the Hard Rock, those 25Ks? One of the best tournaments, I think, of the year because they get like 115 to 16 entries every time, and it's a great purse. But do you remember this where you had <clears> – <throat> I final tabled. I think, yeah, I lost 10s to Jax, to Lonnie Harwood, and uh, Jason. They both had Jax and I had 10s. But this was very bizarre because we – with like nine or 10 left, we all had four to 16 blinds. I don't know if you remember this. I think you were one of the shortest stacks. Um, do you remember how that played out? And like, I, I can't, I just remember actually, I, <coughs> excuse me. I remember actually being tilted because you were, I knew you were crushing one of the best in the world. And I was like, you know, I don't play a ton of stuff. I was, it's in my area. I hopped in the 25, make the final table. And I think I'd like, I was middle of the pack. And I remember getting ninth and I was so pissed off. And I remember you had the shortest stack but like four blinds and then you got second. Do you remember this tournament? Um, no, and when you pulled it up, there was another 25K. In yeah, the, the I saw rock. a bump that you won. Yeah, as well. I, so I, like, I, I thought you might have been talking about that one because that one was an insane, crazy bubble where I actually had a chip lead and there were a bunch of people who, it ended up getting to the spot where like the person in the big blind had like 1.4 big blinds and they were trying to calculate if I fold my big blind and my small blind, will someone else be all in before like the blinds come around to me again? Mm -hmm. And th that bubble just worked out crazy for me because people decided like they were just going to wait everyone else out and I ended up amassing like a huge chip lead on it. Sick. It's crazy how some a decision like that or a little inflection point in the spot where you can really leverage and just it's like it's worth so much money. Um, but yeah, so tell like, I mean, I just this this blew my mind. So you had four blinds. I can't remember all exactly how it went down, but you know when you have four blinds left and you're nine hand ten left or nine left, what is going through your mind? Because that's critical, right? There's like a lot of luck at that point. You're you're in critical life support. You got it. You're all in. It's just the hands are gonna play. Like, how do you find being four blinds nine handed to getting heads up playing for the title like what what is what do you do is there a mantra is there a super how do you how is that possible how did you get second here like with four blinds what are you just are you like the best short stack player in the world as well have you done a lot of four blind big blind work or what what or is it really there's some luck there i mean the big thing you want to think about is where does your equity come from and when you have four big blinds your equity comes from just like just outlasting one or two players like you know you could plug in all the chip stacks into an icm calculator and see what your ev is and then if you have four big blinds and one player knocks out, all of a sudden your ICM value goes like way up. Now you're making more money guaranteed than like your previous ICM value was. Um, mm -hmm. So you're really thinking about laddering. And then as you get more chips, you kind of realize like, okay, now that my stack is big, my, pay my big payouts don't come from outlasting one or two more players. The reason my ICM value is so high is because I'm going to finish first, second, and third a lot of the time. And so you just kind of need to adjust like what you're going for. Very interesting. And looking at this lineup, I mean, we could pick any of these tournaments really, but this is in particular a pretty murderer's row here um, of, of great players. And what is like when you, all right, do you have like a spreadsheet with every player and like this, that, and like notes and how in depth do you go on this? Cause like what, you know, what separates, yeah, it, it, you play with Mateo, so I'm sure a lot, you know, Ben Tolleran, great player, McKeon, uh, Dylan Lynn had some big success. You know, those guys, Sean Winter, a guy also I think he battled probably a lot, right, local in Vegas and, and has some great success. Bring Kenny, number two, and you also great. All these guys, great player, great player, great player. When you battle, like, how 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 is it something where you're like, all right, I think this guy plays, you know, eight to 12 blind poker bad, a small blinds week. Like, how how dialed in are the notes and, like, you're, you're, are you thinking about each player in, in these spots? Like, how, how specific does it go down? Yeah, I mean, against the guys that I'm playing high rollers against constantly, like understanding how they play, like what spots are strong and what spots are weak in is very important. Um, there are some guys who I think give off, you know, some physical tells that are worth paying attention to. And honestly, some others that like just never give anything away, so I don't really bother. Um, and those are things where it's really helpful to talk to other players about. Um, I don't know, maybe it'll be posted in a group chat or something when someone makes like a crazy play and it's just like, you know, watch out for this. Maybe you can take advantage of it. You know, I, I obviously can't get too specific on the like mistakes that I think my opponents are making, but I will say I'm paying attention and trying to do the best that I can against them. For sure. And sort of this run, this is a part of the 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 signature, right? This was your your hot streak in this this year period. I mean, you get a ten million dollar score. What was this like for ten million? The one the one million dollar buy in. What's that like buying in for a million? You know, Antonio Esfandiari, one of my closest friends, Dan Coleman as well, both have taken this down. 
Um, this is Fedor. This was sort of like, but I think it was like where during either he had the run just before or the year before even, where it was his year. Here you guys find yourself one, two. Dan Smith just somehow always in the mix mm -hmm. and getting it done as well. What, what was this like playing for 10 million and, and this prestigious, the one drop as well? It's got the charity component, all that. How, how is this? Is this a signature one in your coming? So it's the biggest score. And it's 10 million. It's pretty crazy. What's that like? Yeah, I would say this was kind of the culmination of my huge year. Um, I think that's a tournament where I, I first took number one on the Hennemob leaderboard, um, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, okay. So you, you have been number one, actually. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was number one until Bryn cashed for $20 million in that one London million dollar tournament. Yep. Um, yeah, I mean, I had won, like, basically all the huge tournaments that year. I won um, the Super High Roller Bowl. Um, and I think Super High Roller Bowl China as well was earlier that year. Um, Pretty crazy. Yeah, it's actually insane. Really insane. Yeah. Yeah. So at the start of the year, there were three giant tournaments scheduled, and I finished first in all three of them, which was just, you know, mind blowingly incredible. Like, it never, yeah. ever yeah. would have expected yeah. that that would happen. Um, and, you know, I was just, I was firing on all, all cylinders. You know, I was playing with a lot of confidence. I was, you know, studying. I was at the top of my game. And luck was on my side. Stop, stop right there. Scroll down a little bit. Uh, you see those those first places in a row. L look at the dates for those first places. Yeah. So twenty I mean, seventh of May, thirty first of May, third of June, and then scroll up. There's one more, sixth of June. In two weeks, I won four tournaments, like all of which were pretty big. You know, a bracelet, a super high roller bowl, two twenty five k high rollers. That was like the most insane stretch of it all. That's where I felt like no matter what I did, I just like could not lose. So crazy. It's uh, and at that point, are you playing around with like you have like a set thing at this point for this year and a schedule? You're telling guys like, hey, like I'm selling this much, you're on board or not, or I swap with these guys this, or are you like as the heater is going? Are you like, fuck, I'm like, why am I? Am I just like lighting money on fire by giving anything away? And now you're bumping up your percentages, or is it kind of like pro, like fixed for a set period of time? Uh, yeah, I bumped it up a little bit. Um, I, I think. There were some other things that weren't doing well, like uh, some crypto investments. Um, it, it was after the one million that I like really ramped up my um, bankroll risk tolerance and started going super aggressive. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I, I ramped it up like right before the streak uh, started going bad. So that didn't work out too well. But it was still obviously a fantastic year. No complaints at all. For sure. And and speaking of crypto, that that key, you know, NFT, the hottest word in the dictionary right now. What are your your thoughts overall? on crypto nft I, mean, I don't want to go down the rabbit hole i just want to know like is that something are you a big believer semi-believer um do you think nfts are inevitable for the future is it just like what's happening and with with these things like or do you think they're silly give me give me your little hot take on this subject which is again we could spend a whole podcast talking about i'm sure but um let's just just give me like a quick little bit on on what your your mind has set for that i'm not like an expert on crypto i, I have some bitcoin and my strategy is just like buy and hold you know let's see where it is in 10 years um and uh, i didn't put a huge amount into it or anything uh, obviously it's doing very well fortunately because i've just been sitting on it um i actually don't have any nfts um i honestly like don't understand the space um I, i'm not going to say there's no value in it i'm just saying that i personally don't understand it um probably is a good investment i don't know mm -hmm. for sure okay fair enough and um what about online versus live? Now you've had the success, you're number one all time live. I don't know where you rank online. Again, it's that's part of the problem. I feel like it's confusing. It'd be nice if everyone just had a number, right? You were number one eight five nine, and like you play on ACR, you play on Party Poker, you play on GG, you play on Poker Stars, or whatever. It's like there, it's tracked, it's easy. You opt in or not, whatever, right? That would be, I think, nice. But between all this, I mean, I, how much do you think you earn on like cashed online? Do you have a general idea, like in a, in a ballpark, even, or is it just too hard to even really know because it's like so many years and now the site, like Pocket Fives and the sites, Party Poker, you have different aliases and like it's like they, they made you change your name. It's it's like it's a little crazy. Like, do you have any idea, like where how much online you've cashed roughly? Um, honestly, no. Um, I mean. You know, people look at my handed mob, they're like 57 million in live caches and even more online. And I hate to break it to people, but my net worth is not anywhere near 57 million. That is only, you know, gross earnings and doesn't factor in all the many millions I put in and buy ins. And, you know, I'm definitely up money online, but up way more live than online. Let, let me ask you this. Do you want me to drop kind of a huge drama bomb or would you rather keep this kind of clean and simple? I have, I have no idea what you're doing or what you're where you're going to. I will say this. I personally, I'm, I don't, I'm not like the big clickbait, 
like looking to stir the pot. But listen, if you, you voluntarily, I don't even know what you're talking about. So I mean, sure, you're this is live. There's no deleting uh, or whatever. So you know, go feel free. You have you have uh, your number one player in the world, man. You got the throne. What do you got? Okay, so uh, for for 2019, there were some huge games on GG. Uh, there was one recreational player in particular that we were chasing around, uh, lost like quite a lot of money. Um, and I, I just ran horribly bad. I lost like 1.4 million in these games. Um, and honestly, that's a big part of the reason why my drive to play poker was like very low, like just like felt like, you know, I just couldn't win. So the funny thing, going back to the, the poker streak, like when I won those four tournaments in a row, I was just thinking like, okay, this is going to come back. Like I'm going to get struck by lightning or hit by a bus or something. Like there's no way I can be this lucky forever. And then turn off like 2019 was the full reversal. Right. Um, and then over a year later, I discovered, um, and, and GG actually announced this publicly. They had closed 33 accounts. Money was seized from about half of them. Uh, they seized over a million dollars from the players um, who had been cheating. Um, and yeah, so this whole time I was playing, I was getting cheated, unfortunately, and also still running bad, but. Right. Well, and but, it's. You know, Jason Kuhn had messaged me like, hey, bro, I hope you're, everything's OK. Checking in just so you know, your name was like brought up in this like this like ring of like thing. And I and I had other people message me. And I'm like, what the hell? I'm like, first of all, I'm not winning on G. I'm like break even or losing on GG. Number two, it was it said the name was Gross Jeff, not Jeff Gross. And it wasn't <laughs> my name, whatever. But like it was like listed and you know, I had people in my Twitch chat coming in like, hey, man, like I heard you're whatever on was so it wasn't me but I, I did i did see that where there was some stuff which is good to know that there's some 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 proactivity on the sites and trying to close the stuff and keep an eye out for people across the board and bots and this and that so yeah but but i do remember hearing about that and there was a list of players and there was that picture too right one of the guys the german guys like he was playing in rta and their their friends like i forget cruz or something was his name oh. maybe yeah, yeah, I haven't seen the picture. Um, they like pushed a shot. They shut. They sent the picture of him like doing the supercomputer. You didn't see that? That was a big. No. That was like how it all spurred. I thought. But oh, anyway, okay. Um, but yeah, so it was like really, really frustrating for me, and like to find out that you know I'd lost my drive in poker over an incident where like I got cheated. And the thing that is most frustrating to me about this is that I'm just I'm playing with these guys live now. Um, a lot of people would be surprised to hear like how many big, well-respected names are on that list. I, I will say I'm really proud of the fact that like my crew, like the Americans that I talk strategy with, like not a single one of them like was accused of anything, no accounts shut down. So like really proud of my friends for that. Um, but yeah, like I was playing a 10K at Aria, call it a month ago, and I was at a table where every single one of my opponents was banned on at least one online poker site, if not two. And like, yeah. I'm oblivious. I'm oblivious to this. I will say I've heard names thrown around, like a, maybe a handful of guys that I know, and I'm like, wow, like those are some big names and big guys in poker and like crushers or whatever. So I have heard a little whispers, but I really am like truly oblivious to to what exactly the accusations are and what's going on. So I, I am not informed, but I do know there's talk of this, like RTAs and this or whatever. So you know, I, I don't. I'm just not fully up to speed, but I know there is talks of that stuff, which is part of my question with online versus live as well. Like, do you think the online high stakes is going to dry up because that whatever people are doing that's wrong, is it just going to be so readily available and like you just can't play? Or is it like sites are combating it and you think it's, it will work out? Um, it, it's both. It's going to be an ongoing battle and like hopefully the sites can stay ahead. Hopefully the, the sites can have measures that if these players are cheating, that their money can be returned. Right. Unfortunately, in the GG case, the, the cheaters were able to cash out a lot of money before their accounts were seized, which is unfortunate. Mm. Um, and I, I'm, I, I've briefly talked to some people at GG. I am absolutely a big supporter and like this information becoming even more public. Um, I, I would love for the poker community to know these names and know the players that they can't trust. Um, so hopefully that is something that will happen soon. Um, but I can't make any promises since, you know, I don't own GG, can't release that right. evidence myself. Well, I know, I know, I know um, that Jason Kuhn, obviously bringing him on in on Oakland ACR, like I said, poker party poker does a lot of pretty intense measures and, and they've done stuff proactively. And then also, yeah, Jason, that's, that's great when you have someone who's in the scene who knows what's going on, who's aware of how it works, what they're looking for, and to, to kind of partner. I mean, that's important. So, yeah, I, I think that obviously transparency, you got to be careful, right? Because you got to be sure. You got to like, there's all kinds of legal stuff and there's also ramifications and whatnot. But yeah, I think that's mm -hmm. uh, that's good. There's transparency and, 
you know, it's like, it's real money. You got people that are competing and playing. And also, you know, the, the other really messed up side outside of just doing that act is like for yourself, let's say you're getting cheated. It's like, it's a confidence thing, right? Cause that carries over to mm -hmm. other areas. You're like, we, maybe someone moved them out of their career and they stopped. They're like, wow, I can't beat the game anymore. Or they're like, well, I was going to play live these high rollers. Now I'm not, or they just, they're just losing and they think they stink or whatever. Right. Like when really they're getting, they're just getting whatever. So I think, uh, um, you know, hundred yeah, percent. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, not only was I questioning my own game, but I was looking at some of my opponents being like, wow, these guys are not making any mistakes. These like weird, crazy computer plays that they're playing. Like, I, I would look some of them up and be like, like, surely this has to be a mistake. And like, nope, the computer does this like weird, crazy line and they, they nailed it. And turns out, you know, it like actually was a computer playing, not a human. Shit. Fucking nuts. Well, that that is nuts. I, I uh, okay, well, hopefully that hopefully there'll be more info and stuff will come out. And, you know, it's... Um, yeah, that's that's sad to hear. But again, anytime there's money in anything or whatever, there's going to be people doing you know stuff and, and whatever. So hopefully, uh, you know, are you, you're confident though? It's pro they have caught. Like, do you think how, how much do you think majority of the people have been like that's that stopped or it's at least caught? Or do you think that some of the other sites maybe aren't quite alert to it and people can always like here's a problem. There's other names. There's other ways. You know, whatever. Right? It's kind of like a it's like a, a, a robber, cop, robber, hackers, and police. Like, there's just like you're just gonna. There's always stuff going on, I'd imagine. So, that's, yeah, that's unfortunately, like GG did some great stuff. Maybe even like stuff that um, actually, I don't want to elaborate on that. Um, GG is doing things that other sites are not doing to ban players, and that means that some of these players are still cheating on other sites. Some of these players have probably just opened up other accounts on GG and are still playing. Um, so, no, I, I don't think like the cheating situation online has been solved at all. Um, and as much as I would love to promote online poker, I, I do have to say, like, I'm sorry, but like, you do have to be careful out there. And if you think you are being cheated, maybe play a different game or play on another site, um, especially at high stakes. You have to be really, really careful. And if you're just playing 50 cent a dollar, like whatever, if it's not your living, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, but in the high stakes tournaments, like you really have to you really have to be careful. For sure. Yeah, no, I think that's uh, that's important. It's also one of the reasons people like tournaments more than cash games online because they feel like you, know, it's, you can't get colluded as easy and it's just harder to do these things. So, yeah, it's really important that, that the sites stay ahead of it and stay on top of it and try to make people feel safe and comfortable as possible and, and that they are doing their job because that's that is scary and unfortunate but um and, and i mean i imagine it's probably much more so at those than some like let's just take like a 500 dollars buy-in or a 200 but i guess it's all relative right because even those stakes and maybe people are doing that too so you just gotta yeah gotta be gotta be careful do you believe it's happening like what would you say the percentage of like mid stakes low stakes high stakes is it is it something you know what would be your guess on that or honestly i I have no idea. I just don't play the lower mid stakes game, so I can't really comment it on it. Um, before these players were banned, though, like I, I want to stress that it wasn't just like a, a chart here and there. Um, especially like the guys at the top of the like cheating pyramid, it was insane. Not only were they using RTA, but they were controlling like four accounts at a time, so they could see like all the whole cards of these other accounts that are at the same table as them. Um, so Damn. like not just having computers play for them, but also like full on collusion, like on bubbles, like really just doing everything. Uh, there, there are two names in particular that like, I, I believe those names will come out soon and I will do what I can to help those names come out. Just like the amount that they did is just like absolutely sickening. Shit. Well, I, yeah, again, I've heard whispers. I, I don't know. I know obviously everyone wants blood in the chat here live and in general, but again, these, I feel like these things always like these type of stuff always does come out and I'm um, sure that that'll come out and be, uh, you know, it, it is what it is. And it's unfortunate. And the whole, you know, I'm sure, unfortunately, probably some people's heroes too, right? Like people like watch them, love them, see them playing and competing live and, 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 and emulate them and whatever. So that, that's unfortunate, but um, yeah, we'll, uh, all right, well, let's let's turn to some brighter things here. And I know you've already been on a while, man. I know you want to, uh, you got a busy, busy stuff going. And so I do want to try to get over to Twitter and take some of these questions. We, we won't do all of them, but the, the good news is if you do ask a question, you are entered for the giveaway. So $100 is going to do it in, in Bitcoin. I would do a, a ticket, but you know, not everyone is able to play on Party Poker or sites that are everywhere. So today we're going to do $100 in Bitcoin, and you are eligible. Just ask a question, 
and follow the instructions. I am gonna go through here and take a few of these. Justin, you're good for some questions and then we'll, we'll kind of shut it down? Let's do it. All right, so we got over 100, 107 questions. Pretty sure it's a record, but as expected. Mm -hmm. So let's, uh, uh, let's just sort of run through a bit and see, see what we got here. So was there a group of players in the high rollers who had the initial access to the PO solvers and hence they had a significant edge for a time? What would you say about solvers and how was that like initially promoted? Was it, like, I don't remember, you know, it wasn't my world specifically at this time, but was this like a website where it was like openly known or was it kind of like guys created and then they like friends shared it and then it started being sold? Like what was, give me like the origins of PO solver. Yeah, um, so I wasn't in in the like the super very beginning. I do know there were some players who had early access. Um, I don't think they were like super top elite crushers or anything, um, though obviously it is a big advantage. Um, I, I, I got in after it was publicly available. Uh, however, there was a, a period of time of like two years where I just like I, I would not say the words PO solver in like an interview or on stream or anything just because like if someone didn't already know about it, I didn't want them to know about it. Um, you know, now it's well beyond that point where like everyone knows solvers exist. So I'm happy to talk about them. Right. Yeah. Well, it's very, it is interesting. Uh, what is the most outrageous buy after winning a poker tournament? And congratulations to success. I hope the poker, poker gods shine on you with clairvoyant reads, favorable flops, winning flops, deep runs, and monster payouts. I already know who that is. Craig Leonard, my man. How are you? Thank you for the question. So most, most outrageous purchase. Did you ever splurge a little or are you just, you know? And just don't don't tell me don't tell me it was like uh you know a nice dinner out give me something give me a little something do you ever go nuts or how i mean that's the answer nice dinner out like it's pretty common like i'll treat a group of friends to like a really nice dinner um i've never like you know i i don't believe like i don't want to own a rolex because i don't want to have something on my wrist that says like look at me i have a lot of money like i, I just I'm, I'm not a big spender nice well that's that's that is, that's a clean way to live. Simple, right? You don't have to, the, I, I, I agree. And, you know, it was funny because at one point I remember thinking about like Buddhists or like that mindset or, or, or monks, right? Like, I'm like, wow, that's so crazy. These guys, how they had it all wrong. How are they just like doing their thing? No, anything, no, whatever. Like, that's a, like, I don't want to use word wasting, but like, wow, that's what you're doing life. But I will say at times where I feel like overwhelmed, too much going on, you know, more and more and more trying to do stuff and whatever. I, I sort of sat back. I was like, you know what? Maybe they got it right, right? Like, it's actually kind of nice to be relaxed, not have a lot of, not be stressed, not worry about anything. And, you know, maybe it's a, it's a, it's a, there's a medium probably, right? Like, I don't think I could be a monk, but I also think sometimes I'm like, man, simplicity is better, right? It's just nicer, easier, cleaner. And um, I, I'm with you on that. So fair enough. Uh, do you have a pair of lucky pants? Do you have any superstitions? Let's just expand that question. Uh, no. No. Um very not superstitious at all and I, I think that's one of the things that you could sh you should try to train yourself to not think about because if you're focusing on that you're focusing on what will make you lucky that means you're not focusing on the strategies that you really need to be implementing at the table um okay i, I agree i think that yeah to have a lack, lucky rabbit foot and rely on that or if you uh it's a dangerous road because then you're just gonna you're putting that on as you think that's part of your your success um, man, there's so many questions that I know we're not gonna be able to do all of them. So I'm trying to scroll <laughs> right here, but, uh, let's see. And if you see anything that jumps out of you, let me know. But, um, <clears throat> if you've, okay. Ghost of M, Marco, the man, the myth, he asks, Justin, if you feel, if, if you feel that it helps to try to keep a low profile, or if you think seeking more visibility is better for most poker pros, I mean, I don't know how you take that specifically, but what, yeah, what's your thought? It's a good question. My answer has changed a lot over time. At uh, it, it first, um, I was, you know, trying to get a sponsorship deal. So I was like really building my name up. And actually, even before then, I was like running a way back in the day. I was running like a rake back thing. So that's why I started my blog 20 years ago. However, long Were you ago sponsored by Bodog for a bit or somewhere? Yeah, I was sponsored by Bodog for a couple of years. Then after Black Friday, it got to the point where it's like, okay, there's not much value for Americans anymore. So I kind of stopped publicizing myself. There really wasn't you know money to be made from it. But then like the high roller scene came and like all of a sudden it was like, hmm, I kind of enjoy people thinking that I'm worse than I actually am. Like I don't like talking strategy at the table because I don't want them to know what I'm capable of. But now with the high rollers, it's like if I'm going to be selling action, I need to convince people that I'm one of the best players in the world, which honestly, I kind of hate that. I, I, I like it when I could just be like, you know, play dumb. People will ask me a strategy question at the table and I'll be like, oh, gee, I don't know what you're supposed to do there. 
That's kind of how I prefer to be. All right, give me, give me a, give me a guy, give me someone who's been in poker for 10, 15 years. They're around break even. Understand tournaments, three betting, four betting, terminology, right? They they get the game. Like what now with the with technology and what's possible? How much you know? How much is it like? How much time? Say you said your mission was to take someone and make them a crusher that could play like put them in twenty five hundreds and be profitable. Like how much work would that take? And how much harder would it be to take someone who's starting today versus someone that's played for ten years has some success? And understand them. I, mean, I imagine it's a big difference, but kind of explain it. Do you think? Because not every yeah. great player is a great coach. Do you think you could mold someone into a mini Bonomo, like a Bonomo two point um, Okay, a lot of questions in there. Um, I will say, like, I can't help it. I can't help it. Sorry. Yeah, 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 I know. I know. Um, it's all good. Um, I, I will say, in, in like the golden age of poker, you know, two thousand two, two thousand three, I could have taught virtually anyone how to make a hundred thousand dollars a year, and it would have been incredibly easy. Um, it's gotten so much harder and not only have the pros gotten better, but even the amateurs now have 10 years of experience. Like there's just, you don't have easy free money out there anymore. Um, if I was taking someone from scratch, it would take a long time. Like there are just so many basics and fundamentals that we take for granted. They would, they would, they would have to learn. I, honestly, I would say it's like not even worth it. If you're thinking about starting poker now to make a lot of money, like don't find something else, find a spot where the money still is easy. Um, and, and that's a natural progression of things. Like um, you saw it with poker, you saw it with um, DraftKings, you saw it with Crypto World, you saw it with Blackjack back in the day. The money is really easy at first if you get in early, but then it gets really, really hard. Um, if someone has already been playing for 10 years, um, it would come down to like what their mindset is. If they are a, a smart analytical person who is willing to learn, then yes, I think I could absolutely give them some secrets, um, tell them the, the leaks in their game, and their game would improve immensely in a short period of time. Um, now, I'm not going to say I could make them a top 10 player in the world or something, but absolutely for a player like that, I could do a lot to help their game if they have the right mindset. Nice. And what would you what would you do other than poker, do you think? Have you thought about it even, or just because from, from when to now, like really hasn't been a reason to even consider something else? But, you know, what, what do you think you would be doing if you weren't playing poker? Um, I, I think there's this assumption, like, what career do you want after poker? And when the question should be, like, do you want a career after poker? You know, I, I don't buy into that, you know, capitalist agenda that you should work 50 hours a week for your entire life and make as much money as you can. Um, I, I don't think that was, that's what life is about. And the reason that I play poker is not because I want to amass a crazy fortune. It's because I just want to be able to continue the lifestyle that I have now even when I stop working. And, and that's my goal. Um, you know, I want to be able to do what I want um, while still being comfortable enough that, you know, if I have children, I could send them to school. Like, you know, I won't have to worry about like where my rent is coming from or my children won't. Um, and, and so that's the long goal just to be, you know, comfortable. For sure. Um, do, uh, let's see, we've got a thank you here saying, um, who do you believe mixes up gameplay the best that you have played against? And MTT did kind of rough rifle off a few names and Chidwick and whatnot. But in terms of actually like mixing up, where like you're like, oh, like today I don't know what version I'm going to get of this guy. Like, oh, like where, like who's who's kind of like got the, the widest gears. Um, there's a Twitter thread thread recently. Was it Remco? I can't remember who started it, but the question was like, what's something that sounds like a compliment that at the poker tables but really isn't? And my answer was. Um, wow, you're really tough to play against. I never know what you have. And that might sound like a compliment, but it is absolutely not. Um, right. I, I honestly, like the players who are really tough are the ones who are like finding these like really advanced equilibrium strategies, not the ones who are just making like crazy off the wall, un unpredictable plays. Mm -hmm. Interesting. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, we got a question about tilt. How do you deal with tilt? I will say your focus is then you seem very present all the time when I've been observing or seeing you play. Like, tell me about that plus tilt. How do you deal so, with someone who's not going well? I'm like, wow, that was a sick beater. Holy shit, that was real equity, that bad river card. Or then I have to fold when I had the nuts. And, you know, how do you deal with that type of uh, mental side of it? So this is one of the things that goes back to the fundamentals, one of the things that I've been talking about earlier, where you need to be focused on the right things. And one of the reasons – actually, I can give you like a little, a little bit, bit of a binary statement. I, I would say – Mostly people get into poker for one of two reasons. Some people, they love the rush, they love the adrenaline, they love the gamble. And then there's the other group of people, they get into it because they love the strategy. And I, I think we've seen over the years that people get into poker because they love the strategy are the ones who have success. 
And to circle it back to this question, uh, the reason is is because they are they are focused on improving their strategy as much as possible, and that's what you do to deal with tilt. Now you can never just tell yourself like I'm going to stop tilting, I'm going to stop being angry. Like that doesn't work. You need to be like, okay, I took a bad beat. I need to be okay with it. Bad beats are going to happen more in the future. It sucks. It is what it is. I need to focus on the strategy right now. That's what I'm going to going to do. I need to focus on what this player is going to do next hand. Am I still playing well? All those things. Um, so yeah, is just focus on the strategy as much as you possibly can. Yeah, and and okay, that makes a lot of sense. And and just sort of like also, it's like a new situation, right? There's one thing Elliot Rowe. I work with him, and I always liked how he explained it. It's like you know, it's a puzzle. It's like now this happened, and now you're not chip leader. You know, you you were first on the bubble. And now you're third or fourth that you're whatever. And like now it's a new situation and you have to, it, I think if you're able to quickly, you know, make that determination that, okay, things are now different and it doesn't matter what happened or how it happened, but here's the situation. And now this is my stack. This is how many blinds I have. Um, I think that that's, I think a lot of people really, even like upstuck is a thing too, right? Like you'll have like, it's crazy. You'll have like, you'll be on break and in the main is somewhere and someone will be like, oh yeah, I have, you know, 10% bigger than starting stack and you'll have like three X starting, but you had nine, eight X starting or seven somehow. And it's like, the, it's like to be able to mentally um, not, not be tilted. So I think, I mean, I guess, would you say that's one of your strongest attributes? It sounds like you're pretty, pretty strong and solid and stable in that, that regard. Yeah. I've just always had this kind of like robotic way of thinking about things. And um, my, my friend Emil Patel came up with a, a nickname for it, Bono logic. Um, it's just like, I'll take things that like people get really emotional about and just like, just, it just makes sense to me in like a kind of linear computer analytical way of thinking. And it applies to poker, but it also applies to polyamory, for example. It's just like, if I'm dating someone, I'm happy in a relationship, I'm still attracted to other people. So why would I get upset if my partner is attracted to other people? And if I wanna act on it, like, why is that a bad thing? And yeah, I just kind of have a matter of fact way of thinking about things that's uh that that's a very interesting yeah that's a good way to to explain it i like that okay that makes that makes really really nice sense um okay so that's we talk about tilt who's the most positive person you know you know phil helmuth is positivity of course his book but who's <laughs> your most positive person helmuth is not even on my top hundred he's constantly berating people at the table that that's not positivity just because you like say some awful thing and then hashtag positivity after doesn't make it positive um, he doesn't give respect where respect is due. Um, where let's yeah. talk about. Listen, I got. I make a disclaimer before we get to fire off on Phil. Phil, yeah, is, I've been a lot of investing with Phil. I think he does a lot of things well. He's a very interesting guy. He's got a good heart. He's a wild guy. He is definitely. He is all of that. He's you know burned the place down. He belittles, berates people. He can't help it. He, I really don't think he can help it. But where does Phil rank? Because Phil just had an epic WSOP. I mean, he had a record final tables. Even though he's playing mixed games, smaller fields. Wins a 16th bracelet. Hard to deny the guy can play some poker tournaments. Where do you believe, you know, I, I don't want to put you on the, the spot, but like Phil, because like he always talks about respect, you know, some of these guys, the greatest players are not respecting maybe his game and whatever. What are your thoughts on Phil? Like, is he just, is this like a, I'll just leave it there. What do you think of Phil Helmy's poker game? I guess and let's focus on that. I mean, he, he's fine at playing, like, like he, he's a mid-stakes player, right? And he does fine. Mid-stakes mid level. There's a reason you don't see by in tournaments or playing in like really tough cash games or playing online in tough games because he knows he is not one of the best players in the world. And that's okay. Like I'm not gonna criticize a human being because they're not, you know, one of the best players in the world. And you know, making a living playing mid stakes, like that's great. He makes a lot of money, he's successful at what he does, and good for him. I, I just wish he wouldn't constantly say he's the best player in the world when he's not even willing to compete against the best. Well, I do know Negreanu, you know, they had their battle, which was pretty crazy, like how, you know, when you hit at Wayne 3 and was super short and came all the way back, but more so that I believe Daniel challenged him, right, to like bring him into the high stakes arena, like to play the 25 case plus and make a bet. I don't remember what happened with that exactly. And Daniel is someone also who, you know, obviously one of the biggest names, if not the biggest name in poker, one of the biggest um you know, has worked hard so hard, him, Seidel, to play in these high rollers and compete. And I think Daniel's done a lot of work on his game in the last few years, basically saying, like, look, I realized I wasn't at the level to compete with these guys. And now he, you know, I don't know where, like, in terms of that, would you say, like, Daniel, though, because he does compete regularly at the highest level and, and, and perform in these high buy-ins. Would you, like, how, how do you, how would you, like, consider, like, the? I, I always think, like, the bigger four and, and 
poker, like the original guys, like in tournament poker. I got Ivy Helmuth, Negranu, and mm -hmm. Espandiari. And Antonio doesn't really, you know, he's more doing cash games and relaxing and not really playing this tournament scene anymore. But you know, give me like those four in comparisons. Would you put Negranu in the high stakes category though? Like he's he is playing and competing mm -hmm. at the highest level. Out of those that group of players, I would say for No Limit Hold'em, the Eric Seidel is far and away the best of that group. Mm. Um, Negranu would be number two, but a decent bit behind Seidel. Um, I think Negranu is winning in almost every tournament he enters. Like a tournament needs to be like really, really tough for me to want to bet against Daniel. Right. Yeah. Fair enough. And Phil Ivy, I mean, he hasn't. It seems like he, has, you know, he does pop back in a bit. I think on some of the Tritons. You know, you've seen him, you probably competed. He's like short deck seems to be doing very well. But you know, where where what about his game? Because he's like one of those guys that's immortalized, right? Like everyone, it's like a lot of, everyone's heard of Phil Ivey's in mainstream commercials. You know, he's kind of uh one of the more recognizable names. Like where where what about his his game, his tournament game? Because he's also like like one of those kind of guys that he's got that poker feel. Antonio as well, and Espandiari is just very, very well versed at the table. But Antonio will be the first to tell you he's not a solver guy, you know, he's not like doing deep work and he's very realistic on where he stands and what what's going on in there but what about ivy like how do you think he's perceived in the in the high stakes community for like tournament players um honestly like i haven't seen much from ivy in like the past four or five years i don't i don't know if what his like bankroll's like or what games he's playing in so i can't really comment on his game now yeah um i will say that absolutely 10 15 years ago he was incredibly tough and and even in the days when like solver things started or people were using like what was it card runners ev things like that and he really wasn't even though he wasn't really playing by the book um he's always been just like a really really tough player um so yeah certainly one of the greats of all time yeah because then he took down like him and antonius they were in that 64 person heads up like 25k they did like live i think it was in, in mexico somewhere and like he just won it like i mean it just seems like he just still is able to win whether or not he's doing the all the work or not but you know just kind of one of those guys that has a nice poker feel i mean you just want to know that you can't really count out but probably not up to speed with the top few guys or top five guys right I mean, is that fair yeah, yeah i mean my, my base assumption is that if someone is not playing high stakes no limit tournaments like they're probably not using like a ton of solver stuff and they're probably not going to be an elite player um yeah. I, i'm sure ivy could get to that level if he wanted like I, I literally don't even know does he play no limit does he play mixed games now so i can't really comment on where his game is at right now for sure. And who are some of your, who are some people, you know, we'll take one or two more here and then we'll, we'll shut this down. Who are a couple more, a couple guys you grew up with that you looked up to, whether it was the way they played or just like on TV that you grew up watching poker and who you were like, you know, kind of, I don't want to say heroes, but just that you looked up to and, and, uh, and, and really wanted to, to kind of, you know, celebrate or who you, who you enjoyed watching when you started. Uh, I used to love Barry Greenstein. The, the amount of money that he gave to charity, I just thought was like really, really cool. Um, and, you know, while, while I'm talking about that, I want to give a huge shout out to Dan Smith, the stuff that he has done for charity. I, I wish I knew what the number was. He's raised like $13 million or something for charity over the past few years. Um, if you're not familiar with this, please check out, you know, Dan Smith Hala on Twitter that you can Google double up drive charity. Um, it, it's the whole idea is matching. Um, he'll get people who are willing to donate like $4 million or whatever, but only if their contribution is matched. Um, so basically what that means is your, the money you donate will be doubled or even quadrupled in some cases by someone else. Um, he does it every December around Christmas time. Like it's already started for this year. Mm -hmm. Um, please Dan Smith, double up drive. Like, please, even if it's only like $20 is going to people who really need it to organizations that really need it. Um, please look into that and give what you can. Very cool. Dan Smith, legend, legend of the game. Great guy. He's been on the podcast. Uh, Vajran, let's make sure we put this in the show more. This will be up on all the outlets and on YouTube. So let's make sure uh, we do put that on in the show more uh, up top. And yeah, please, guys, I've done it. I've been a part of it. I know that Dan is a very, very generous guy. And yeah, it's uh, like you said, it does add up, especially when it's getting matched and some. So uh, make sure you guys check that out. And, and very cool, Dan, to follow through and take the time to organize that and obviously reach out right on people to get, get people to find, to match it and, and do a bunch of work with that. So very, very cool. All right, let's take one or two more. Uh, oh, let's ask, I want to ask you about your parents. What do they think about all this? And when, when did it take convincing? Or was it pretty obvious quickly that you were, you know, a sharp guy that was going to do well? Or was there like, hey, don't gamble? Or are you sure you're flying overseas to play poker or games? Like, what, what was that like? From, from um both. So so my mom is my biggest poker fan in the world now. She has like a shrine built in my honor and it's got like 
every card player or bluff magazine article I've written, like great photos had been taken of me. Nice. Uh, I give her all my like trophies and rings. So she's put them on so showcase there. Um, and she loves like, if I'm doing well in a tournament, she'll like check the live updates, call the neighbors, call grandparents, like whatever, and tell them I'm doing well. And she gets super excited. Nice. But at the, at the first, she didn't really understand that like, she thought it was gambling and you know technically poker is gambling but she she thought like eventually the casino is going to take all your money and it took her a long time to understand that it's a skill game and i'm not competing against the casino i'm competing against other players who are less skilled than i am um, right i would say it took her a few years to really understand it and once she did she started really supporting me very cool. my my dad on the other hand um saw right away he was just like okay justin has always been good at math he had a knack for magic. Uh, he would succeed over other players in magic. Poker is also a skill game. Like, and he just had you know faith that you know I would be able to succeed, and he knew that I was making smart decisions. And yeah, he supported me from the start. I'd say. Very cool. And the last question I want to ask is: if you were to look right now at the the current state of poker, and you were just like, you know what, for 2022, if you were in charge, if you could make a big decision. You know, we saw Big Blind Annie shot clocks come in. Mm -hmm. Would it be the chess clock? Something else? All, what is something that you believe that would like help the game of poker overall? What's like one thing that stands out to you that you just think is like, wow, like how are we not getting this right? It's so obvious. Um, yeah, shot clocks are a big one. Um, we need to have more of those, especially in high stakes tournaments. Honestly, it's a, it's a lot of little things that. Um, Paul, the floor man, Aria, he gets everything right. I just wish every floor man would do exactly what he does. There are spots where like players will come into these high rollers and be like, okay, there's five players on this table, but there's six players at the table I want to be at. So I'm not going to register right now. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, Paul has listened to the players throughout the years. He's like perfected everything. So it's now like when you draw, you when, when you enter a high roller tournament with Paul, you have a random chance of being at every table. So there's no like trying to like pick your table, wait for the right time. If you want to play, just get in now and it's all going to be random. And, and I wish the foreman, especially in these small field tournaments, were more aware of these things, these spots where players are trying to get edges, spots where maybe players are not entering the tournament because conditions aren't aligned for them. Um, yeah, I just wish Paul Campbell would be the, the king of poker and everyone would just do everything that he says, to be honest. Strong praise. And, and yeah, I know he's a great guy. Yeah. That's uh, by far the best floor man that I've ever seen in my 20 years of playing poker by far. Very cool. Big praise, big, big stuff. And uh, we appreciate the time this has gone, I don't even know how long. It's uh oh wow, holy shit! I am that's two hours. So Justin, <laughs> I thank you. I hope well, I I I got. I hope that camera. I did send you that camera. I know you were short, and we got you, you. loaded up there. I'm gonna. I, I would love to take you out to dinner next time we're together. This was a. This was definitely longer than I anticipated, but I I really enjoyed the conversation. I honestly didn't realize that long. I'm I'm hopping on with uh, Michael Lancar and his show here coming up, but I just um, I apologize for. Um, I know I was saying around an hour, so we really let it run. Thank you for not cutting me off. And um, any anything else? I guess I, real quick, I will do this this giveaway. I'm gonna we're gonna give away a hundred dollars in BTC. So I will go ahead and load this up. In the meantime, is there anything you want to mention, talk about, like closing statement? Um, where can people follow you? I, obviously, I have it. I showed it Twitter, Instagram, anywhere else, and, and anything else you want to mention on the way out here. Um no, it's, it's been a great stream. Thank you so much for having me. I would say in the past two hours, by far the most important thing that I've said is Dan Smith's Double Up Drive for charity. Please look it up. Give what you can. If you only take one thing away from this stream, let it be that. Dan Smith Double Up Drive. Okay. Again, guys, check that out. I will um, put that again in a link. And real quick, we're gonna I'm going to let you choose when for this $100 winner and how about this of course the tool doesn't work technology is hard somehow i haven't i'm rusty i haven't been on here instead why don't you pick a number from one to uh 107 uh 56 for sure has 50, to be 56 56 well i was thinking that's how many million you won but that's not right because it's 57 why 56 oh, no. that number um yeah just complete random number that pops in my head <laughs> 56 all right well i am going to not leave you here while I count 56 people. This is old school. So I'm gonna go ahead and choose number 56 down the list. They're gonna win $100 in BTC. Uh, in the meantime, I'm gonna raid Mr. Uh, Lon Carr and we will, what are, what are you playing? You got, there's still more turns to Bellagio. What, what's tomorrow? Today's the PLO one you're not playing. What, do you, what is next? Oh, yeah, uh, 25K high roller tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, 25k high roller and then and then what the main event and that's gonna wind it down for you or 
There's like four 25Ks, the main event, and then there's that uh, 50K I was talking about earlier at the end, the Poker Go Championship, whatever it is. Very cool. All right. I am going to send this raid. I'm going to close this down. This is podcast number 153 in the books, the man, the myth, the number one all-time money list current holder, Justin Bonomo. Thank you for the time, man. Really enjoyed it. Hope to see you at Burning Man next year. Hope to hang out soon. I'm taking you to dinner uh, next time we're, we're in the same place on me. Um, and I uh, appreciate the two hours plus here. So thanks so much. Enjoy your day, man. It's been fun. Thanks for having me, Jeff. Awesome. Cheers. All right, guys. So that is it for Justin Bonomo. And tomorrow we will have John Party and then Jeremy Ostris next week and going to have Scott Ball. So we'll see you uh, tomorrow for that podcast. And I'll see you on Michael Lancar's show here as I end this broadcast. We'll see you over there.